throughout history and across the ideologies that divide us as human beings, two things have remained constant. Curiosity. Curiosity that drives us to learn more about ourselves, the world around us, and our interaction with each other. And the second thing is hope. That expectation that builds within us, having learned about our world around us, and having discovered information that can help us to live better lives and interact better. This research conference on innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology is a continuation of this pursuit. Chairman of the University of the Commonwealth Board of Director, Dr. Donald Rooms. UCC Board of Director, Directors and Foundation Members. Executive Chairman of the UCC Group of Company, Dr. Winston Adams. Deputy Executive Chair of the UCC Group of Companies, Mrs. Geraldine Adams. University President, Dr. Aldine Davies. University Chancellor, Professor Dennis Gale. The Most Honorable Professor, Professor Kenneth Hall. Executive Vice President for Institutional Effectiveness, Research and, and Research, Professor Bernadette Warner. Supervisors from the University of Sunderland in the United Kingdom. UCC 2022 honorees, Dr. Leighton McKnight, Dr. Godfrey Dyer, and Dr. Sandra Reed. Other special invited guests, learned research presenters, and all other participants. UCC faculty and staff, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's the second day of the sixth annual academic research conference at UCC. The theme for this year's research conference is harnessing the power of technology through innovation for global resilience. But in keeping with good order, we will now have an invocation from a lady who is full-time faculty and the head of department for behavioral sciences here at UCC. She holds a bachelor's of art degree in guidance and counseling and a master's of art degree in counseling psychology. Is currently a doctoral student pursuing studies in clinical psychology. She's a motivational speaker, an associate psychologist, and within our church organization, she is a care group leader and a mentor. Please, whether you are online or in-house, we ask for a round of applause for Mrs. Ayoni Miller for our invocation. Let us pray. Oh God, oh Father, we thank you for the opportunities and the blessings of this day. We thank you for sparing us the words of Hurricane Ian and for protecting us from other perils and dangers that could have prevented us from having this research conference. As we convene today, we invite you to be with us. I pray for your special blessings upon those who will present today. I ask you to give them boldness and courage so that their presentation will not only be insightful, but will also bring inspiration to us. I pray you shall help us as a team that whatever we shall grasp from today's conference, we shall work together as one towards that goal for which you have allowed us to plan that mandate that UCC has laid out. When we are united, we can achieve that goal together. And so that is the blessing we ask of you today. We thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your leading. We say thanks in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, Mrs. Miller. 
Yesterday, our sixth annual research conference began in earnest. And as I said before, the theme for this year is harnessing the power of technology through innovation for global resilience. And yesterday we heard from our doctoral research students. We also heard from undergraduate presenters. And just like yesterday, today we will be having a special workshop on research tools, analytical research tools that can be used, that you can use to understand better your world around you. To bring us welcome and opening remarks is the current chairman of the board of UCC. Dr. Donald Rooms also serves as a professor of Florida in, at the Florida International University in the College of Business with emphasis in the area of expertise in community engagement, small business innovation, and stability, sustainability. Without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Donald Rooms, the chairman of the board of directors of UCC. Please make him welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, good morning, everybody, good everyone here. Welcome, those of you viewing online, uh, protocols already established, welcome. You know, today I must also thank Mrs. Ione Miller for that inspiring prayer to get our day started. How much we do need to get off on the right footing, so thank you so much for that. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it is, as you've heard, it is day two of our sixth annual academic research conference put on here by the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. And as we are focusing on the theme, innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology, it is fitting to note that we have been building here something of a great momentum at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. So we're putting in place here an infrastructure where our students can thrive, where our faculty and our staff find it real pleasant to call this our home. And so we are building something that all of Jamaica can be proud of. On day one, our focus in this conference predominantly was on undergraduate and a doctoral research presentations. Our students are very involved in the process of learning. What they're doing is integrating their knowledge and skills that they've developed right here. And they're integrating that in a way to create answers, solutions to some of our most pressing societal needs. If you were joining us yesterday, you would have seen this yourself, how much they were engaged in presenting solutions. So UCC, we continue our leadership in bringing relevance to our curriculum and also consistency in its delivery of cutting edge research. Research that is both 
scholarly, and pragmatic. Today is day two, and we will continue in that same vein because right now we will be looking at faculty presenting their own research, as well as graduate students presenting research options that they've been working on and that they are so anxious to share with the wider community of learning. So in the end, what is it we're doing? We're putting together an infrastructure that will involve not just our faculty and staff here, but all of Jamaica in moving forward in solving our problems. The day will be capped off by a thrilling presentation from our keynote speaker, Mr. Wayne Beecher. So ladies and gentlemen, get ready. This is day two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Donald Rooms, Chairman of the Board at UC Board of Directors here at UCC. Indeed, our research here is not only academic but also pragmatic. So, as Dr. Room said, we will be hearing from faculty today. And for faculty research presentation, I, I will guide you through, I'll moderate the section. Our first presenter for this section as we begin in earnest today is Dr. Veronica Reed. Dr. Veronica Reed received her PhD in business and management from the University of Nottingham in 2011 and has been the associate professor in the School of Business here at UC, Business and Management here at UCC for the past two years. She teaches across the business subject, but currently she's facilitating entrepreneurship and micro, macroeconomics. Over her time at UCC, she has been keenly interested in how to teach research methodolo methodology uh, to our students. Her topic for today is interrogating the use of mixed method research in undergraduate studies, a critical reflection. Please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Veronica Reed. Hello, good morning, and thank you very much for making the time to be with us today. As you've heard this morning, I'm going to be discussing pedagogy. <laughs> I'm interrogating the use of mixed methods research in undergraduate research projects. Thank you. Now, annually, it is observed that there's a large minority of undergraduate students at the university that we are studying that complete a monetary research project and they use a mixed methods research. However, in examining their projects and their presentations, we have seen evidence that their understanding of mixed methods research is limited as a number of important errors were repeated across these student groups. Now, what do we mean by mixed methods research? Johnston and his colleagues define this as the type of research in which a researcher or team of researchers combines elements of qualitative and quantitative research approaches. And this is done for a number of reasons that include breadth and depth of understanding and for corroborating results. Now, the impetus for this research is not only within a single university, but there has been research previous research showing that instructors of mixed methods are often self-taught, lacking adequate training in both qualitative and quantitative approaches. Students themselves are not often trained in both research approaches, and so there is a dual gap that can result in deep pedagogical issues that compromise students' ability to fully understand the mixed methods research practice, and it leaves the teachers feeling ill-equipped to address the students' learning outcomes. In investigating the literature in more detail, I realized that there is actually limited research on teaching research methods to undergraduate students, particularly business students. So it's inherently challenging to teach research methods 
but there has also been little research in this area that can be used to guide those who are teaching. Additionally, when it comes to mixed methods research in particular, there is less research literature and commentary on how to teach research methods in these areas compared to other fields such as behavioral sciences. And then coming down further, undergraduate students are not the same as postgraduate students. So while there is some research on postgraduate supervision and how to do this well, research indicates that undergraduate students generally are uninterested in learning research methods compared to postgraduate students. And therefore, we cannot necessarily translate what we learn from postgraduate supervision to the undergraduate process. And therefore, there is both significance in this topic, in this research, in terms of contributing to the literature on research methods pedagogy, because at the moment it offers limited insights, limited guidance for lecturers, and lecturers are often left with a trial and error basis for developing their practice. And therefore, this lack of an explicit and shared methodology makes it important for research to be conducted in this area to stimulate a pedagogic culture, dialogue, and definitely development of teaching research methods to undergraduate business students. And so what I'm going to be doing here is really just introducing you to an area that I am exploring and that I'm looking to, I've been working with some other people and I'm looking to explore further over this academic year. So I'm very much interested in students studying at the university level and lecturers facilitating these students and the particular predicament, predicament of interest is the overuse of specific methodologies by these undergraduate students. So at the moment, the aim of the first part of this research program is to examine the research approaches that are used by undergraduate business students in completing their group research projects in order to understand their decision to use mixed methods as they are novice researchers. Later on, this understanding can then contribute to developing the pedagogy of teaching research methods particularly at the undergraduate level. And again, to guide the beginning of the research program, we wanted to find out whether mixed methods research is being used appropriately by undergraduate students, and why would they choose to use a mixed methods approach in their first project. Now again, turning to the literature, we can see that there are good reasons that mixed methods research are used. Now, in general, researchers will turn to mixed methods for completeness, triangulation, enhancement, explanation um, of, their, of their research questions, and there are many other reasons as noted by Bryman. For undergraduate students, there has been some research in that area, and it shows that when undergraduate business students do mixed methods research, it improves their data analysis and triangulation skills, but it also helps them in terms of their professional development. It improves their work readiness and it gives them other skills such as greater communication and teamworking skills. However, the question that is coming to me as someone that teaches methodology, methodology is that there are many challenges in using mixed methods research. Now, especially for novice researchers, it is difficult to bring together adequately qualitative and quantitative paradigms so that you get a robust mixed method research design that you can then effectively deploy. We also have to think of the many practical challenges that are faced by students who are doing research methods. So first they would need to learn both quantitative and qualitative styles adequately if they are going to be mixing them in a research design. It also calls for using multiple sets of data collection and analysis, and they should be giving additional justification for using these two methods. 
We also have to think with undergraduate students in particular, that they have a tight schedule for completing their research projects, and they usually have other courses that they are completing along with their research. So this offers practical challenges in terms of using mixed methods. From the lecturer's perspective, we also have to think of the pedagogical challenges. Researchers such as Ivankova and Plano Clark argue that a different approach is needed to teach mixed methods research, and therefore that opens up questions for us as lecturers as to whether teaching quantitative and quanti qualitative without a specific mixed methods element is effectively preparing our students to do mixed methods research. Now, in order to tackle these issues in more detail, especially for this first part of the research, I'm using critical reflection as a research method. Now, this is something that I myself am still learning as a business researcher, but this methodology is well used within education. And the reason that it is well used is because it has been shown to offer deeper and more complex understanding of practice experience. And it has been credited for developing new knowledge and insights into professional practice. And since this is exactly what I'm trying to do here, the critical reflection method is something that I wanted to employ. And also in terms of contributing to the literature, literature methodologically, using critical reflection rep represents a departure from other types of teacher inquiry that you will find in a lot of the literature where I'm not specifically concerned with researching my own practice, but I'm looking at a set of wider diverse practices and the aim and the reason for doing this is to get a more comprehensive look at research methods ped pedagogy as a field rather than looking at individual practices, but looking at those more um, as a collective. I'm involved in what we call an abductive research process that began with real life observation. So observation of this intersection of novice researchers and mixed methods, which um, deviated from my prior theoretical knowledge in terms of how it is best to teach research methods or how it's best to get novice researchers into research. So the aim of an abductive research process is to understand a new phenomenon and to suggest new theory. And so from my marketing background, I'm familiar with the concept of commodity fetishism. And I did some research in the literature and I got um, very interesting research in terms of a theory on method or technique fetish, which I will discuss shortly. And so after looking at the literature and identifying one or more theories that might actually match my observation, the next step is to go back to the empirical stage where I've done some amount of participant observation, but I will discuss how I'm planning to develop that in, in, in more detail towards the end. Now, when we talk about fetishization and fetishism, fetishization refers to a process of imbuing up an object or an idea with power. It marks a cultural, psychological, and social technique for fetishizing things by making them appear larger than life. While fetishism is a means of identity building and it provides psychological and social, sociological affirmation. However, as we will discuss again a little bit later, it can sometimes be problematic because it can manifest in an irrational devotion and commitment to a particular thing. This concept is being applied to the method or the technique that is used by researchers. And so Wastel has argued that method or technique fetish refers to the encouragement of a rigid and, me and mechanical approach in which methodology is applied in a ritualistic way that actually inhibits creative thinking. From this perspective as well, other researchers have talked about the role of scholarly gatekeepers, such as lecturers, such as research lecturers, whose insistence on methodological sophistication 
and indoctrinated thinking often means that this is done at the expense of importance, novelty, and really the interestingness of findings. And so what I was trying to do in terms of having these initial observations, looking for a theory that could match, and then in the initial phases saying, does this theory make sense? Is there any evidence that there may be fetishization, that there may be method or technique fetishism going on? And so we can link this back to the first research question where we asked, is mixed methods research being used appropriately by undergraduate students? And based on the observation, initial participant observation over two semesters and across three different research supervisors, mo most of the students that were using mixed methods were not using them appropriately. The students did not effectively engage with qualitative research in particular and did not show an appreciation for the fundamental differences between qualitative and quantitative research, which would be necessary for you to effectively conduct mixed methods research. Additionally, again, highlighting this lack of engagement with qualitative methods, students were largely unable to present their results qualitatively. And so, for example, when students did interviews and said they analyzed them thematically, which we would expect to see thick, rich data in terms of quotations and things like that, but we get pie charts and we get um, bar graphs. Further evidence of fetishization of method relates to the reasons that novice researchers may choose to use mixed methods research in their own project. From their own perspective on the value of mixed methods that is gleaned from, again, the participant observation, almost uniformly the students said that the reason for using mixed methods was triangulation. So when you do triangulation, you look at data from different points, for example, and in order to try to say what is the truth. However, we usually do not see them coming from two different perspectives. They almost always present a positivist perspective. And usually, as I said, no qualitative results are actually presented in terms of coming from both sides. We also see where the supervisors and the adjudicators, when they present their, their um, projects, their perspectives on the value of qualitative research in particular may also be a reason that students choose mixed methods, but at the same time do not necessarily apply these mixed methods effectively. So most of these supervisors and adjudicators have a quantitative background and show limited appreciation themselves for the benefits of qualitative research and often qualitative research was seen by these adjudicators as fundamentally limited. And so even when students said they did mixed methods research but only presented quantitative results, there was usually no pushback. So the kind of feedback that the students should have gotten to indicate that they needed to have both sides, they were usually quite fine with only presenting quantitative research. So what does this mean or what does this tell us if we're trying to link this to fetishization? So again, if we think about the theory, on one hand, practically, students and researchers may be looking at mixed methods as a each way bet, as argued by Bryman. You win if your horse comes in first, second or third, right? So it doesn't matter, it, it, again, it, this idea of triangulation some of the students may think that you don't have to do the research effectively as long as you are doing enough of certain things. But this indicates a lack of understanding on the students and even some of the supervisors' parts about the purpose of using mixed methods research and how to do mixed methods properly. So we are seeing from the perspective of the students where the scholarly gatekeepers themselves in terms of their supervisors and adjudicators may also be the ones that are leading them to the path in terms of the purpose of mixed methods research. As we wrap up, I want to talk about why fetishize a method. Sometimes methodologies are treated as a fiction to present an image of control or to provide a kind of sim 
symbolic status. And Wastel goes on to say that while methodology might masquerade as the epitome, epitome of rationality, it may actually be operating as a ritual, as an irrational um, ritual in which enacting that ritual provides both lecturers and students with a feeling of security and efficiency. So if we go through the motions of doing certain kinds of research, we expect certain types of results. Unfortunately, this is at the expense of real engagement with the task of at hand. And if we think of methodology and research as a craft, then we would also have a problem necessarily with this kind of rigid perspective on doing research. So finally, what I've presented today is the first part of the abduction process in terms of the participant observation, initial empirical research in terms of is this theory of method fetish potentially applicable to this data set? In order to really provide full results and present recommendations for practice, which is what I would really like to do, there is more data collection that is necessary. So for this project, I've been working with Dr. John Fulton from the University of Sunderland. He's in charge of postgraduate research there. Um, we are talking about the next steps in the research. So for example, I'm trying to work with Mr. Madden to do some surveys with students. I've also discussed with Dr. Denny about doing some qualitative interviews with both students and lecturers. And there is also a host of other data available in terms of student presentations and student projects that will allow us to develop this topic and understanding of this topic in more detail and come up with recommendations for practice. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, Dr. Veronica Reed. Uh, that was indeed a very interesting presentation on your preference of research methods. And I, I suspect, I strongly suspect we'll be seeing some changes in the way we engage our students going forward in their research pre presentations. I suspect you might have questions for, for Dr. Reed and for the other presenters that will come. This is how we will take questions. For those participants on Zoom, there is a Q&A button that you will hit and type your questions. Those questions will be sent to us. And at the end of the section, we will have the, the participants, the presenters address those questions as we look on how these research presentations can be applicable within your special sphere where you operate. So as we continue the faculty research presentation, our next presenter is an assistant professor in the Department of Business Administration, Dr. David Bennett, obtained his PhD in organizational development from Grand Canyon University. He published in peer review, he, he published in peer review in the areas of organizational commitment, job satisfaction, leadership, and has been a part of six doctoral dissertation committee defense. He believes, he's a strong believer in the concept of student-centric learning approach to ed education. Please give a round of applause to Dr. David Bennett, our next faculty presenter. I'm Dr. David Bennett, assistant professor in the School of Business at UCC. The topic today is retention of secondary school teachers, organizational commitment and job satisfaction among teachers in the Caribbean region. The purpose of the study is a study attempt to measure the type of relationship existing between overall job satisfaction and overall organizational commitment among school teachers in the public educational system in the Caribbean region. The significance of the study, studies have found that when a particular teacher has a high level of organizational commitment, that person tends to be more satisfied and ready to serve his or her school. As a result, this research study examines the important topic of job satisfaction and organizational commitment among secondary school teachers 
in the western part of the Caribbean and the northern West Indies. Literature review. Firestone and Pennell stated that when a teacher tends to have a high level of dedication and care towards his or her profession, consequently, that person is usually more committed to his or her job. In essence, a, a particular teacher commitment is a critical component to determine the effectiveness of a particular school. This is because a highly committed teacher is usually willing to expend additional efforts in the achievement of a particular school objectives and vision. One might argue that over the years, study of concern in organization commitment and job satisfaction among secondary school teachers globally have produced similar findings. For example, theories such as Apia, Agingun, Supin, and Sepepra found that secondary school teachers in African countries such as Ghana had a positive relationship between job satisfaction and organizational commitment in their jobs when certain factors were satisfied. These factors include opportunities for personal growth, favorable working conditions, among others. Meanwhile, studies done in other countries such as Australia also found that there was a positive relationship between variables such as organizational commitment and job satisfaction when certain factors include personal growth, recognition of teachers, among other factors were fulfilled. The research question is to what degree is overall organizational commitment significantly correlated to overall job satisfaction among teachers who work in the public secondary schools in the western part of the Caribbean and not western West Indies. The alternate hypothesis is there is a positive correlation between overall job satisfaction and overall organizational commitment among teachers who work in the public secondary schools in the western part of the Caribbean and northern western West Indies. The null hypothesis is there's not a positive correlation between overall job satisfaction and overall organizational commitment among teachers who work in the public secondary schools in the western part of the Caribbean and not western West Indies. The methodology is that it's a quant we use a quantitative methodology in terms of a relationship between the variables. The sample size n is equal to 200, 200 participants. Convenience sampling was used to collect data in three secondary schools in the urban part of the western part of the Caribbean and not western West Indies. The data collection process consisted of two established and validated survey called the MSQ, Minnesota Satisfaction Questionnaire, and a KUT, the Klein Unit Dimensional Target Free Scale. The findings, it was found there was not a strong positive correlation between overall job satisfaction and overall organizational commitment. All right, the discussion and conclusion, the findings of this study should assist educational administrators and government officials understand the importance of having satisfied secondary school teachers. And it's because an effective secondary school educational system depends on committed and satisfied teachers employed in that educational system, such as the edu secondary educational system in the Caribbean region. Also, the study has some limitations in that the participants were conveniently selected from certain secondary schools in two countries, located in the western part of the Caribbean and the northwestern West Indies. It only attempts to examine the overall satisfaction, job satisfaction, and overall organizational commitment among these secondary school teachers. Therefore, the results of this study should not be generalized to all secondary schools in the Caribbean region. All right, and that concludes my presentation on, on this topic. The next presenter is Dr. Peter Endaja. Dr. Endaja received his first degree in computer science and mathematics and his master's degree in mathematics from the Federal University of Technology in Nigeria. Dr. Endaja is a recipient of several international scholarships from bodies such as the Center of Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Dr. Endaja received his doctorate from Niigata University in Japan in 2011. His thesis was based on the application of total variation functional. His book on the subject is rated as one of the top 20 books of all times on image detection. 
He holds a position of university administrator for the past eight years. Currently, Dr. Indaja is the head of the mathematics department here at UCC. His topic for today's presentation is an iso isotopic image detection for total variation functional. Please, please make Dr. Indaja welcome with a rolling rose of applause. Good morning, all. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking about on the anisotropic um, flow and how we use it to detect edges in images. Um, so why do we use anisotropic flow? So in math, we have two, in partial differential equations in general, we have two types of flows. We have the isotropic flows, and we also have um, the anisotropic flows. So anisotropic, uh, isotropic flows are flows that flow equally in all directions with equal energy in all directions. Uh, take the flood, for example, say you pour water on a, on a flat surface, it's going to flow in all directions with equal energy. But anisotropic flow selects the direction in which it will flow. And we use this, so we use this for image edge detection as well as the isotropic flows. So I'm going to, in my results today, you're going to see um, both kinds of flows that work on images. Now the total variation functional actually is, is not a very difficult idea to understand. Uh, if you are familiar with, um, say, how functions behave, you know that when you take the integral of a function over some intervals, sometimes the integral will vanish. And that means that, say, if you integrate over some positive parts and some negative parts, um, when you add them up, it becomes a zero. Something like the sine function, for example. So, those kind of functions sometimes are not very effective for certain things that we want to do. And um, we have come up with different kind of devices to counteract this kind of uh, situations. And the total variation functional is one of them. Okay. So the first, um, we, I'm going to give an introduction. Um, I'll talk about the total variation functional briefly. Uh, we'll look at what the total variation of an image will look like. All right, we'll get what we call the Euler equation for the total variation functional. We'll look at some um, partial differential equation filters, and that's why I'm going to talk about the isotropic flow as it relates to uh, images. Okay, then we'll look at what our results look like compared to what other people have done before. Because what we have done is to take the standard, which is the Malhildreth method for um, uh, finding edges in images. This has been used for more than 40 years now. So, but it has some drawbacks. Our method uh, solves quite a number of the problems that um, the Malhildreth method uh, presents. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll do a comparison. And I think after that, um, we'll look at our experimental results. And you can tell for yourself which method is better. Okay. So the total variation function itself was first defined by a man called Camille Jordan. He's French or he was French, and uh, this was back in 1881. And what he did was to um, take a function, break up the function, take derivatives in parts of the functions, and find only the absolute value of those derivatives, add them up together. That's what forms the total variation. So for us, I'm not going to go into all those um, mathematical details. Um, so, um, 
for edges in images, you will wonder why we need to find edges in images at all. The reason is very simple. Uh, for some applications in computer vision, uh, we need the edges, we need the edge information. So what is an edge? Is where, let's say you take a photograph, um, Dr. David Bennett, as you move from professor, one contrast to the, the other, or from one color to another, the boundary between those colors is what we call an edge. So for example, if you have a device that uh, does face recognition, and you want to log into your computer, uh, it will look at your face and try to take some features. The computer doesn't use your picture when it does the face recognition. It takes what we call the principal components from your face. And a part of those principal components are some edge lines on your face. So for example, if you, if you, if you, if you register into the system, with glasses on, you might be surprised to see that when you want to log in without your glasses, the system may not recognize you because the system would have recognized some components that, that were very vital for you to log in, but you have to put back on your glasses for those components to be, um, to be recognized. So, so edge, edge detection is a fundamental operation in image processing, and it is used for quite a number of things. Um, even driverless cars use it, um, feature detection, um, object tracking, um, and so on. So if you're going to develop a technology that is based on um, edge detection, you would want a very powerful edge, det edge detection method in the first place, or an algorithm. And so uh, we worked on this, and what we've done is to uh, improve on what other people had done before us. So search, the edge detection comes in two ways, in two forms. We have the search-based methods, such as the CANI method, edge detection method. We also have the zero-crossing-based methods, such as uh, the Malhildreth method, or what we call the Laplacian of Gaussian method. So this is just uh, what I was saying earlier on, how you break up a function um, into sections and you find the absolute value. And when you take the supremum of that, you get what we call uh, the total variation of a function over an interval. Right? Now, the, the, the definitions uh, that, I, that I just showed works quite well under what we call the Riemann uh, uh, on the, for Riemann integrable functions. The Riemann integrable functions are usually smooth functions with no discontinuities at all. And so uh, what do you call a discontinuity? Let's say you're traveling on the road and there's a broken bridge, that is the discontinuity. But it doesn't mean that the road stops there. Now, the problem with the Riemann uh, method is that it does not recognize those kind of discontinuities. Once there's a discontinuity, the Riemann, integrable, uh, the Riemann integration method fails. And so um, a man called Lebeck came up with a different way of um, carrying out integrations and measure. So you will hear sometimes we talk about uh, measure theory in the sense of Lebeck or taking a measure in the sense of Lebeck. So Lebeck, Lebeck's method is able to measure a thing, uh, functions that are very, very discontinuous and we still get a value, we can still get a meaning from it. And so, the Lebesgue in, uh, method of integration has been used widely, especially in things like signal processing, um, even in image processing. And that's why you can see that what I'm doing here is simply just um, using the Lebesgue method. All right, so the total variation would be the positive measures uh, plus the negative measures in the sense of Lebesgue. And that way we are able to get what we call a, Le uh, a Lebesgue integrable function f, okay, um, that we can now use for our purpose. All right, so any function that is L1 integrable, all right, and whose special derivatives in the sense of um, distance or measures 
with uh, we have something like but, and has a finite total variation in a region, uh, any region at all, called omega. Uh, we call these kind of functions uh, functions of bounded variation uh, over that interval, and it's just the integral of um, the total variation over such an interval. I feel I'm boring with too much mathematics, but uh, uh, so I'm going to make it short. Okay. I think I uh, would go to, so this is a definition of the total variation functional in two dimensions, because the images we deal with are actually two dimensional um, uh, objects. Uh, we can extend it to any number of dimensions actually to three dimensions, four dimensions, and so on. But I think for images, two dimension is enough, okay? So now you see um, that is the, the functional under the integral. Now, what we need to do is that when we have a functional like that, it tells us that there are many functions that we can, that we can plug in, but how do we get the best function? What we want is a function that uses the, the least energy to do the job, okay? It's like you're selecting people uh, to carry out a task, right? You are not doing the task, you're just trying to select people to carry out the task. And so to get that kind of function, we use, we use methods in the calculus of variations to minimize the function and get that uh, function that will do the job for us. All right, anyway, in our work, we derived a new way of obtaining the total variation functional. And um, if you're interested, you can always uh, reach out to me. I can always give you the manuscript. Okay. So once you minimize um, a functional, you will get a partial differential equation and you get when, where you take that partial differential equation, that partial differential equation, when you solve it, it will give you the function that will give you the best edges. That function will always be the best function. You will not get a better function to do the job. So these are just discretization because we are working in what we call the analytical space, but we are going to implement it on a computer. So to implement it on a computer, you have to discretize. I think if there are students listening to me here, you would, and you're maybe in IT or so, you would have done something called discrete mathematics. So you discretize it, um, and then you apply some numerical methods to uh, carry out your task, okay? So this was what I was talking about. The Euler equation of the total variation functional is, is written in this to minimize, to obtain the Euler equation of the total variation functional. And being that we're dealing in two dimensions, it's an image that's a two-dimensional function. So we obtain a partial differential equation. Okay, so this is our Euler equation, you can see equation 20 gives the Euler um, equation for our, for our, um, uh, for the total variation function, okay? So I just, all these are just mathematical processes. And the most important thing that you need to see here is the final result of all of this, okay? So you can see I put J mean there. Um, that is the minimization of the total variation functional. U is defined as equation 31 or 32, whichever way you want to look at it. Okay. So uh, now let's look at the image filters. So this is the Laplacian filter, right? And earlier on, I talked about the Laplacian of the Gaussian. So what we do is when we take the image, um, we first use the Gaussian to smooth the image. And the Gaussian is simply the function that you use in the normal distribution. Yes, 
so it's very common. I think all of us would have seen that at one time or the other, right? So we use the Gaussian to smooth the image, and then we apply the, um, the filter. So the filter we are using is the Laplacian filter. And this is the method that Mar and Hildred used back in the 80s, right? So another way to write it, instead of writing out all that long equation 36, okay, it amounts to the mask you're seeing there as the matrix, right? If you apply that matrix on the image, it's the same as uh, running all of that uh, equation on the image. Okay. So this is our first filter. You can see the original image and the image to the right is the image filtered using the Laplacian mask. Okay. Uh, so let us see. This is another example. Uh, this is uh, an image uh, I'm using and I filtered it with the partial differential with the Laplacian filter. So the, the, this, 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 uh, this matrix is just another filter that you can use. Okay, so applying the second filter, you get this result, all right? Again, I repeated the same filter of mask, mask, uh, masks one and two. All right, so let's look at the total variation filters. What do they do? So this is the image that we saw earlier on. This is the total variation filter. So you can see that it gives a lot more detail than the Maran and Hildred methods. Now we saw this image earlier on as well. And let's, so let us see what the total variation filter does. You can see that it's, I think it is more vivid than the last one. So one other thing that uh, differentiates the total variation filter from the Mara and Hildred method and other methods actually, is that when you apply the, um, the isotropic filters, which Mara and Hildred use, you, it, you will get two edges, okay? So what we, we call that the double crossing. Now, we do, you, you, you have to choose which edge to use. But the total variation filter doesn't do that. It gives you an edge in the right place, okay? So uh, this is an image and we filtered it using the Mara and Hildred method, okay? And what we did is to uh, take a close up of the image. This is the total variation filter of the same image. And you can see that in the previous results, the results of Mara and Hildred, you can see the two edges there. For the total variation, it gives you just one edge. All right, so let's say now we have, um, this is Lena. Is a famous picture we use in image processing and in computer vision in general to carry out research. Um, here I am smoothing the image with um, Zigma equal two, or rather the standard deviation of the normal distribution that was used to smooth the filter as two. We use this as scales, and these scales tell you that the larger the scale is, the fainter the, the edge will be. So what happens, for example, if we continue to increase the scale, because that is very important, all right? So if you take an image where the edges are very faint uh, and you apply the Mara Hildred method, uh, because of the faintness of the edges, you might lose a lot of uh, the edge information after you, after you process it. So that has been one of the um, serial methods. So here we are smoothing this image with uh, Zigma equal two, and let us see the experimental results. So this is 
uh, the Mara Hildreth me uh, method or what we call the Laplacian of Dossian. Okay. And in this experiment, um, we had to increase the magnification or the strength of the edges by 30 fold. Okay. This is uh, the total variation uh, result. I'm coming. Did I go? Yeah. So this is the result for uh, total variation at the same scale. Uh, in this case, we did not magnify the strength of the edges at all. Right? So let's see what happens when sigma is three. So when sigma is three, um, the maran hildred method will look like this. Okay? So let's see what the total variation method gives. Right? All right, so let's go to when sigma is four. When sigma is four, this is the, um, the, the Maran Hildred method when sigma is four. When sigma is four, this is the detail of the total variation method. Okay, so we did it up to five. Let's see what it looks like at five. At five, um, I don't know if you can make out the edges, but they are there. This is for the former method. So this is our method when sigma is five. So in other words, um, we can continue like that on and on, but what, what, what we concluded is that the total variation uh, method is what we call scale independent. In other words, at whatever scale, as long as an edge exists, the total variation method will find it. All right, so to conclude, um, we know that the, the total variation methods give stronger edges and greater detail than the Mara and Hildreth method. The total variation filter will produce a single strong edge. Um, the zero crossing methods used in the Laplace and of Gaussian uh, uh, need some smoothing and thresholding and things like that, which is not necessary in the total variation method. In other words, the number of operations that you have to, the uh, computer operations that has to be carried out to achieve um, a filtered total variation image are fewer than you would have used with the Mara Hildreth method. Okay. So where do we go from here? Um, the goal is to start applying it in uh, things like feature detection, uh, to use it in, um, in other algorithms that do uh, for in computer vision and so on. So that's where we are at the moment. I thank you very much. Thank you so, so very much, Dr. Endaja. Uh, you know, there, there's a time when students will say that mathematics, after studying mathematics in, in school, they can't think of the practical application. But today, today, we see where there's a practical application for visual. hit that button, type your questions, and we will have those questions addressed in short order by Dr. Indaja and other presenters in the faculty section of our research conference. Again, thanks very much, Dr. Indaja. I, I think I'm, I want to go back to start studying math again. I, I'm seeing the practical application. Our next presenter is Dr. Kurt Brown. Dr. Brown studied at UCC, University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. He also studied at the Commonwealth of Learning and Walden University. He's a trained teacher with a diploma in education from Church Teachers College. He presented research works at conferences at the University of the West Indies, 
Catholic College in Mandeville, and of course, here at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. Dr. Brown is currently a full-time lecturer at UCC in the School of Business. He holds a bachelor's degree, two master's degree, and a doctoral degree. Today, he'll be presenting, an again, a very relevant topic, crowdfunding awareness amongst university students studying entrepreneurship in Jamaica. Please, a round of applause to make Dr. Brown welcome. Good day, my colleagues. I am Dr. Kurt Brown, an assistant professor at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. And today, I'll be presenting the results of a survey Now, this survey is titled Crowdfunding Awareness Among Jamaican University Students. Now, let me start by giving you some background information. Now, the expansion of businesses remains a challenge for entrepreneurs worldwide. And a reason for this is the inability to secure capital. Now, entrepreneurial startups expand to increase their customer base and raise profits. Now, current research suggests that crowdfunding can be an effective approach for securing capital to fund startups and existing businesses. And the major goal of crowdfunding is to secure small monetary contributions from a large pool of people from the general public. Now, the purpose of this quantitative survey was to measure crowdfunding awareness among university students. And the focus was on Jamaican university students. And these students, importantly, had recently studied entrepreneurship at a course, and they, in fact, studied entrepreneurship prior to participating in the present study. Now, this Research study has significance, especially as it relates to university curriculum planners. And these curriculum planners can incorporate the value or usefulness of crowdfunding in course outlines related to entrepreneurship. The business communities across the world, they can also yeah, adopt crowdfunding practices and the Jamaican government can foster a public education program on the usefulness of crowdfunding. Now to some literature review. So crowdfunding is really and truly raising large pools of funds from small contributions. And crowdfunding importantly nowadays is done via the internet. And crowdfunding, it is conveyed in the literature to have occurred across two eras. First, the ancient era and the modern era. There are, there are some benefits of crowdfunding, and these include an efficient way to raise capital. Another benefit is the opportunity for businesses to market their existence. One drawback of crowdfunding, according to the literature, is that businesses can become damaged if their proposed fundraising projects fail. Now, some information as it relates to crowdfunding awareness. Now, according to one study, approximately 42 of entrepreneurs in the Philippines were not aware of crowdfunding, sorry, were aware of crowdfunding platforms. According to the results of another study, approximately only 44% of the entrepreneurs who participated in a study in India were aware of crowdfunding. And furthermore, according to a study by the World Bank, the level of crowdfunding awareness in carbon countries appears to be low. Now, to our methodology, 
Now, this study included 90 participants from a Jamaican university. And the population of the students who were targeted for the study was 235. Now, as I said before, the students had completed and um, I mean entrepreneurship as a course. Convenient sampling was employed. And the reason for employing convenient sampling was because of time constraints. The instrument was a Google Form questionnaire with 12 measurement items. The questionnaire was validated by two research methodology lectures. And no reliability test was done on the questionnaire, again, due to time constraints. However, the data was coded in an Excel spreadsheet, and the statistical techniques used for data analysis were frequencies and percentages. Note two or results. Now, it should be noted that 14 males participated in the study, 75 females contributed data, and one of the participants was not willing to indicate his or her gender. It should be noted that 10 of the participants had ages ranging from 18 to 25, 26 of the participants had ages ranging from 26 to 30, 29 of the participants was, were between the ages of 31 to 40, and 17 of the participants were between ages 41 to 50, while eight were above the age of 50. Now, 84 of the participants had indicated that they would be willing to become an entrepreneur, while six revealed that they would not become entrepreneurs. Now, 61 of the participants indicated that they were unfamiliar with crowdfunding. That's 61 out of 90 participants. 27 of the participants responded that they were somewhat familiar with crowdfunding, while only two conveyed that they were familiar with crowdfunding. Now, to a brief discussion. Now, the results of this survey are consistent with earlier studies. Now, approximately 68% or 61 of the 90 participants were, were not familiar with crowdfunding. Now, according to a study conducted in India, only 44 of the entrepreneurs were aware of crowdfunding. And many entrepreneurs were participants in this study. And also, according to the World Bank, the level of crowdfunding awareness in the Caribbean appears to be low. And the same can be said of um, these um, participants, because 68% of them had said they were not familiar with crowdfunding. Now to our limitations and recommendations. One, the use of convenience sampling, right? And two, no reliability tests done on the questionnaire. Some recommendations include a replication of the study with a randomized sampling technique. And I would recommend to Jamaican universities who um, which offer uh, offer uh, entrepreneurship as a course that they emphasize crowdfunding 
value in their entrepreneurial course. In other words, they emphasize the usefulness of crowdfunding as a fundraising tool. Okay, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. The moderator for this section is Dr. Janelle Allen. Dr. Allen is a Vincentian talent management and education consultant. She's currently attached to the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean Global as a regional project implementation director. She has over 13 years in educational leadership and training. She has a bachelor's of arts in psychology and public sector management, a postgraduate certificate in education from University of the West Indies, Kville, a master's of science in occupational health psychology from the University of Nottingham, and she holds a, doctor, a doctor of education in higher education leadership from the University of the West Indies Open Campus. She's a Christian, a Rotarian, a mother of two. Dr. Allen is committed to living a life, a purpose-driven life. To bring us, moderate the section of graduate research presentation, I now hand this, the research conference over to Dr. Janelle Allen. Thank you so much. 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 So while we sort out our technical dif difficulties, I am going to welcome our graduate presenters for this morning's session. I think we've been having a pretty good research conference so far, and I want to applaud all the presenters who've gone before for sharing this rich information with us. And I look forward to those that are left to come. So at UCC, we have a number of graduate programs and we're privileged today to be able to share with and learn from our graduate students in the Commonwealth Executive Master of Public Administration program. These students, of course, have been doing their research and are eager to share with us some of what they've found and it's so that we can learn and, and hear more about how these findings can help to impact development, not only in Jamaica, but throughout the Caribbean and even internationally as well. So the first group of students in this program who will present for us today consists of Bevan King, Yvette Spencer, Anne-Marie Abrams, Nadine Whitley Brown, and this group is led by Paul Clark. That first group will present on their research topic, Jamaica Constabulary Force, so the JCF in crime prevention, focusing on the Kingston Central Division. Of course, if there are questions as the presentations are being made, you feel free to put them in the Q&A section on the screen if you are joining us virtually, or if you're in person, then you would channel those questions to the panel after the presentation has been made. So at this time, I'd like for us to welcome Paul Clark and team, and let's hear from them on their research presentation on the Jamaica Constabulary Force. I am Paul Clark, and I'm here to present. It's entitled Geographic Information System Used by the JSF in Crime Prevention. And this project was a group effort completed by myself, along with Donna Cole, Nadine Wheatley Brown, Anne Marie Abrahams, Bevan King, and Yvette Spencer. So I'll delve into the introduction of the topic, which we had spoken on the background of the study. So we spoke of the historical crime statistics. We spoke of JCF transitioning to GIS 
and uh, we spoke of the economic background. And uh, this research was conducted in the Kingston Central District in Kingston, Jamaica. And we had further defined the problem statement, which is crime, the major public safety issue for Jamaicans. So in our research objectives, we had to evaluate the use of GIS by the GSF to prevent crime. Secondly, we had to determine if GIS information is used to inform policies and policing strategies. And thirdly, we had to determine the impact of GIS in, on crime preventions. And our two main research questions that we had focused on, number one, how can GIS be used to inform policing strategies in the Kingston Central Division? And the second question, how effective is the use of GIS technology in mitigating and preventing crime in the Kingston Central Division? So in our research hypothesis, we had established that there is no relation between GIS and the crime prevention in policing strategies used in the Kingston Central Division. And secondly, the use of GIS tool to measure criminal activities is not an effective way in preventing crime in the Kingston Central Division. So in our research, we know we have our limitations, and we have five listed. So our first limitation is that some of the questionnaires were incomplete as a result of COVID-19. Um, we have access to executive personnel of the JCF which was unlimited access in that regard, time restriction and budgetary constraints. So in our lit review, we had a focus on three key areas. The use of GIS globally in crime mitigation. Secondly, crime and violence in Jamaica. And thirdly, GIS as a partner for policing. And in the theoretical framework of things, we looked at three theories. We looked at the social disorganization theory, the crime pattern theory, and the rational choice theory. So in the social disorganization theory, we have seen where crime stems from poverty, unemployment. So we had looked at these areas, and we had seen where crime is being rampant. And for crime pattern, we had to look at a specific area to determine where these crimes are happening and the frequency of these crimes. In the methodology, we had a research design. We used mixed method research design, which is both qualitative and quantitative. And our population size, we had a population of 389 and with a sample size of 194. Our data collection, police officers, we had issued questionnaires. And for the GIS unit, we had ISIS questionnaires also. And we also did unstructured, unstructured sorry, interviews. We had to look at the ethical considerations. So the obligations to society, obligations to the JCF and its use of the GIS tool, and its obligations to the individuals. So in our qualitative results summary, so we had asked the GIS supervisor, we asked him, did the implementation of crime mapping had a significant impact on crime levels? In his response, he has stated that the GIS assisted in the reduction of crime by mapping hotspots, and it also improved the deployment of police to identify hotspots, resulting in crime reduction in target areas. Challenges faced regarding the use of GIS to mitigate crime. He has stated that the major challenge of the GIS tool is mitigating crime by attaining accurate locations to crime habits. Locations do not have proper address in this regard. Further questions were asked, do you believe that there is a lack of awareness in the GIS tool? His response was, he believed that there is a lack of awareness regarding the tool. And uh, did the GIS is the best tool to mitigate crime? He stated that the supervisor indicated that the GIS tool will be great to mitigate crime, but it has to employ persons to navigate the system. We had seen where statistical analysis showed that there was no significant statistical relationship between the implementation of GIS as a crime prevention tool 
and the crime prevention strategies used in the Kingston Central Division. Secondly, the supervisors that we had interviewed indicated that the GIS can be used to show a correlation between victims and perpetrators. In our implications of the study, the GIS tool can assist the JCF to mitigate against crime. The GIS tool is more effective when coupled with other initiatives involving the community and all other forms of policing, the business community, and other forms of information technology. The research cannot be generalized, meaning due to varying characteristics and cultural context of crime across five JCF formations. In our recommendations, we looked at five. So we looked at capacity building. The JCF should employ regular training to improve the competencies of its staff, especially the GIS personnel and police. Secondly, staff recruitment. The benefits of GIS to crime fighting can be improved if more GIS staff are hired to operate the system. Data protocols. Protocols should be established around data collection, input analysis, and process outputs. Further research, especially in areas of artificial intelligence, and we looked at the use of technology. Additional technology can be used and to aid GIS, such as crowdsourcing, to operate the crime occurrences and to mining social media data, etc. In our future research, we looked at how to enhance the predictive accuracy of the system. And secondly, we had to explore it, explore, exploration sorry, of ways to enhance hotspot analysis, system citizenship, science approach, and data mining. So that concluded our presentation. And uh, I hope future researchers would tackle this thesis as there are more exploration of these topics that needs to be done with regard in GIS. And uh, thanks so much for your time and uh, do have a great day. Thank you so much, Clark, for a very informative presentation, very relevant material being presented, um, especially now that criminals and criminal activity has become so high tech. We really do have to increase our level of intelligence in terms of the constabulary force and any other law enforcement bodies in Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean. Increase that level of intelligence that we have to effectively tackle crime at its source and bring the relevant perpetrators to justice. So if there are any questions at this time, we take them for Clark and his team. If not, then we'd move right into our next presenter. Thank you Clark and team for a job well done. Wishing you all the best with the remainder of your studies. We'd move right in now to Rayon Walters, Richard Schloss, and Adrian Andrian Bailey, I'm sorry, who will share with us on their research focusing on, I'm sorry, we'd take White. My apologies, White. My apologies. Raquel White is leading the team of researchers consisting of Marsha Roman, Paul Sargent, and Robinson Thomas. And they've dealt with factors influencing employee job performance of public sector workers in Jamaica who worked from home during the COVID-19 pandemic. A very relevant topic, one that I particularly am excited to hear about. So White, over to you. to discuss our research. I hope you're seeing my slides well. So the title of our research is An Examination of Factors Influencing Employee Job Performance of Selected Public Sector Workers in St. Andrew Working from Home During the COVID-19 Pandemic in Jamaica. The members of our research team included Marsha Roman, Paul Sargent, Mr. Robinson Thomas, and myself. Okay, so in terms of just an overview of our slides today, I'm going to aim to quickly provide 
I look at why we did the study, the theoretical framework that underpins our study, our methodology. And then I'll give you some insight into the research process, analysis, the key findings, or discussion, conclusion, and recommendations. All in 10 minutes. So in terms of a brief background to the study, we chose this area because we are primarily public sector workers in our team, and we wanted to explore an issue affecting public sector workers or the public sector with, for which we could provide some policy solution. The restrictions imposed during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic led to one in five workers globally transitioning to work from home. And this was unprecedented. This was according to the ILO in 2020. Now in Jamaica, public sector workers were placed on mandatory work from home orders for all work that could be digitized and completed at home with access to internet and computers. Now, before the pandemic, telework was not popular in Jamaica, and that was found in a study done by Dunn in 2009. But following the work from home orders, research shows that some 60% of organizations implemented, implemented work from home arrangements. Past studies done in the nations where work from home studies were shown where, where work from home is practiced. Those studies showed a mixed result in terms of the effect of work from home on productivity. Now, when we consider that we have eight years remaining for Jamaica to achieve its vision 2030 targets, the importance of public sector workers in Jamaica's development, and at that time, not knowing how long the pandemic would last and how long work from home measures would remain in effect, we also realized that policymakers were thinking about incorporating a national work from home policy to adjust to what was being termed at the time as a new normal. So we thought it was important that such a policy needed to be anchored in empirical data. We did not identify any studies conducted in Jamaica that examined the effects of work from home on job performance of public sector workers. And so we proposed this study to provide research findings that could shape public sector policy and contribute to the body of research being done to examine the effects of the pandemic on key aspects of society. Now, considering all this, we set out to answer two key questions. Which factors most affected the job performance of public sector employees who work from home during the pandemic? And did job performance differ significantly among age groups and between genders? So those were our research questions. Now, based on previous studies, we identified several factors which could affect employee job performance, but five key factors emerged, dominant as being likely to affect employee job performance during this unprecedented time. We identified one key study conducted in Indonesia by Donny Solicio, where factor analysis was used to identify the key factors affecting employee job performance within the context of working from home during the pandemic. As such, our objective was to analyze the relationship between these five key factors and job performance of public sector workers in Jamaica. And these include leadership, motivation, the work environment, work from home, and selected demographic variables. For us, it, this was age and gender. Now, based on these research questions, we crafted five null hypotheses that would be tested to prove if there was a relationship between the key independent variables and our dependent variable, employee job performance. The research was anchored by three main theories which look at what motivates employee behavior. The models and theories that are best aligned to our research pur purpose or research questions on our hypotheses included the job performance theory, which applies to job performance and motivation when working from home, the six factor model of psychological well being, which relates to work life and psychological well being, and theory X and Y, which apply to the motivation to motivation and working from home. 
The review of the literature revealed that in most instances, there was a significant and a positive relationship between job performance and each theme that was being studied. Some studies, however, did not find a significant relationship between work from home and job performance. That was the Silicio study that we had looked at. And the results were also mixed for age, the relationship between age and job performance, and gender and job performance. One of the gaps we found in the research is that there was limited studies on each of the factor within the context of work from home or among public sector workers. So we designed a cross-sectional quantitative correlational research design. And we adapted the Cecilio questionnaire, we got his permission. We added demographic variables that were missing. And we also added some exploratory variables from a new lab study that was also conducted uh, during the pandemic, looking at work from home. We wanted to ensure that Jamaica's findings could be compared with contemporary research and provide a baseline that future researchers could reference. The questionnaire was converted on Google Forms uh, for the ease of distribution due to the gathering restrictions, limiting face-to-face -face contact. And uh, we were able to include in our survey middle, executive, lower level management, general staff who were employed to the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Education, who worked from home. We also looked at their supervisors and managers who would have supervised staff during the COVID-19 period. We, in our initial discussions with the HR managers, they were unable to quantify for us the number of persons who work from home or fit within the criteria of our study. And so we had to choose a convenient sample. This is non-probability sampling. Uh, but not wanting the sample to be arbitrary, we used G-Power software, and this suggested a sample of 250 employees and 100 supervisors. In terms of the research process, we did a Cronbach Alpha analysis to test the internal consistency of the results. We did frequencies that were analyzed to provide some descriptives. We added the Likert scale scores of the factors that were being studied and found mean scores. And then the shapiro wilk normality test was used to identify if the data was normally distributed. Um, this would determine if we would use a parametric or non-parametric statistical test to analyze the relationship between the variables. Now, only one of our variables was normally distributed at work motivation. It had a p-value greater than 0.05. So the Spearman rank or the correlation was used to test the hypotheses. Then we answer the research questions based on the findings. All right. So this table will show you all of our hypotheses the, the variables that we use and the fact that we use the Spearman's rank or the correlation. Now to our findings quickly. Now I wanted to share with you some very interesting findings that we found in terms of the descriptives, but we don't have the time. So hopefully you'll get access to the, 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 the PowerPoint and you'll be able to see those. Today, I will just share a few things with you. So our, in terms of our response rate, we had 40% of our employees who responded to our survey, that's 99 persons. The sample of 99 participants resulted in a medium effect size um, in terms of the G-Power, which is still good. In terms of the Cronbach Alpha, uh, we did find that a number of our factors, um, internal consistency was not what we would have wanted. In terms of our demographic profile, almost three quarters of our respondents were female, while males accounted for 27% of the sample. And the largest proportion, 42% of the respondents were general staff. Middle management accounted for 32%. Equipment wise, we found that three quarters of the respondents were to some extent prepared to work from home, which is good. And this, revealed, this was revealing the fact that most respondents had the essentials. For example, 95% of the respondents had access to a computer, 92% reported that they had strong internet connection, 66% had headphones, and 67 had a desk. In terms of the time period where people work from home, the largest proportion of the respondents work from home for more than one year. 
and just over half the respondents of some 54% had worked from home for less than one year. Most persons had worked from home for two days each week. Most persons, you reported that they worked in their living rooms and uh, another similar proportion worked in the master bedroom. Regarding the furniture, a little over half the, the respondents, 51% used a desk, while just under one third use the dining table. So that's just to give a frame, a context as to the working conditions of the staff who responded to our survey. Also, I just wanted to add that a number, we found that the majority of the persons said that they had persons working in their workspace and that affects their psychological well-being because we looked at whether or not people felt isolated or based on the results, people were going out to, to, to work or working from home two days per week. They still had people around them and surprisingly, not many of the persons indicated that they had to do childcare while they work from home, which was interesting, given that the majority of our sample were female. So let's look at our hypothesis testing. Almost out of time. Now, as seen in the results here, when we use our Spearman's correlation coefficient, there was not a statistically significant relationship between job performance and the work environment, work motivation, and psychological well-being. The coefficient, however, show that job performance had a positive relationship with work from home, job satisfaction and leadership, each at the 0 0.01 significant level. Now, okay, so let me jump quickly to the other one. The Spearman's correlation coefficient revealed a negative relationship between gender and job performance at the 0 0.05 significance level. There was, however, no statistically significant relationship between job performance and age. Now, what does all of that mean? With these results, we rejected the null hypothesis for leadership, work from home, and accepted that there was a weak, positive, and significant, statistically significant relationship between these factors and job performance. We also rejected a null hypothesis for gender and accepted that there was a weak, negative, and statistically significant relationship between gender and job performance. Based on the findings of the hypothesis testing, we accepted the null hypothesis that there was no statistically significant relationship between the factors age, work environment, work motivation, and job performance. So what does all of that mean? So this, there's a statistically significant relationship between leadership, work from home, gender, and job performance. The results are, are consistent with several past research findings on leadership, work from home, and gender, but it was different, our results were different from most of the studies related to the work environment, psychological well-being, um, work motivation, and age. Our major finding was that work from home significantly affects job performance. And based, I'm sorry, based on these results, um, we did not find a statistically significant relationship between as I, I had indicated that before. So let me jump forward. So what are our conclusions? Based on the research questions that we asked at the start, we can conclude that leadership, work from home most, are the factors that most affect job performance. And as it relates to the demographic variables, job performance differed significantly between genders. So what are our conclusions? The positive we conclude that the positive correlation between work from home and job performance implies that employees who work from home were more likely to perform better at their jobs. The positive correlation between leadership and job performance implies that better leadership will more likely improve employee job performance as they work from home. The negative correlation between gender and job performance implies that women in the public sector were more likely than their male counterparts to perform better at their jobs when they work from home. That's interesting, yes? Now we had some limitations, right? Not, we did not have direct contact with the participants, which resulted in a low response rate. 
and we were not able to quantify the population. We had to use a convenient sample. So the findings of the study cannot be generalized to any government ministry or the wider public sector. The data was not normal. And so we could not use regression analysis to explore causality, why we found the observations that we did. Now we do suggest that this study be repeated and that an attempt be made to use probability sampling to define the population in, in, in some way so that we can do probability sampling. We also suggest that we should include a qualitative component, Dr. Reed spoke of that earlier, including evaluating the results of performance evaluations rather than relying on the self-reporting of the staff. We also suggest that we further explore the relationship between gender and job performance within the context of working from home. Now, what are our recommendations? So even though our findings provide insight into the factors influ influencing employee job performance while working from home, future researchers can conduct more studies that are more precise and accurate. The findings can be applied, however, to the ministries, departments, and agencies that were studied. And so we recommend that these entities invest in leadership development among their managers and, supervisor, and supervisors, that they need to incorporate work from home as a normal part of work arrangements and ensure that any work from home policy that is developed is gender sensitive and responsive. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. These are our references. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, White, for a very informative presentation. Lots of rich information coming out there. And certainly a lot of information that HR managers can use to champion the work from home cause moving forward as we rethink and reshape the future of work. If there are any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section now. If not, then we will charge straight ahead to our next set of presenters. So White, thank you to your team for a very excellent presentation. And we'll turn our attention now to Rion Walters and his team, who will share with us on their work having assessed public-private partnerships by the National Housing Trust in providing affordable housing to its contributors. And we look forward to another engaging presentation by Walters, Schloss, and Bailey. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Rayon Walters, and I am presenting the research done by myself, Andrin Bailey, and Richard Sloss, as we assessed public-private partnerships by the National Housing Trust in providing affordable housing solutions to its contributors. In this presentation, we will seek to take you through the research um, briefly, starting from an, a, a background all the way down to the findings. All right, so in conducting the research, we recognized anecdotally before that there is a huge gap in the housing market, particularly among low to middle income earners. And using information provided by the Office of the Prime Minister, we recognized that there is a annual demand for housing of 14,000 14, units and the market presently supplies five to 6,000 solutions per year, which creates a gap of nine to 10,000 housing solutions needed. Based on the census conducted in 2011, we realized that the demand for housing ranges about in 30, in 34,500 persons annually that would require housing solutions. Now, the lack of housing solutions would create several problems, um, chief among them squatting, crime and violence, particularly when you consider the fights associated with deadlift and the general affordability of housing for the population. Now, the significance of the study is that 
they, they, the study will assess the use of public-private partnerships by the National Housing Trust for the provision of affordable housing for low-income earners in Jamaica, Jamaica. The research will build awareness and it will benefit all stakeholders involved. So the research was premised on five questions. Questions were, what are the NHD's experiences with public-private partnerships? What has the public sector done without public-private partnerships? What level of success was derived through public-private public partnerships? What were the challenges faced or may have been faced in public-private partnerships? And to what extent has the contributors benefited from such partnerships? At the onset of the research, we had certain limitations and we sought to manage them. Chief among our limitations is that Mr. Sloss is a member of the NHT's public-private partnership in project management department for over 21 years. And as such, we would have expected that, you know, his peers below would have wanted to impress him and the ones above him would want to ensure that they don't look bad to our junior staff. So we sort of managed that using the bracketing methodology. Um, we were again limited by the restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic and the availability of respondents to participate in the interviews. Further delimitations was that we had to use a small sample size. We selected six um, respondents using a qualitative approach, and we only considered NHT contributors. So we left the unemployed out and the non-compliant members of the institution. In a review of the literature, we recognized from the research that there was not much information on this topic in Jamaica because it was never studied. But from our assessment, starting with a definition, Brock defined um, public-private partnerships as, a, as collaborations between government companies and firms within the public the private sector, and these parties. Part, these partnerships are usually put together to tackle large infrastructure. Oh, I am moving the slides. I don't know. I am moving it here as we speak. Um, oh, I don't know. It is shared. Oh. Sorry about that. I was seeing something differently on the screen. All right, so starting again, Brock defined public-private partnerships as collaborations between government companies and firms within the private sector. And these partnerships are usually put together to tackle major infrastructure projects such as transportation networks, parks, houses, hospitals, and other major product um, projects. The, Can the Canadian Council for PPP further defined the concept as a, co a cooperative venture between the public and private sectors built on the expertise of each partner that best meets clearly defined public needs through the appropriate allocation of risks, resources, and rewards. These partnerships more often result in increased efficiencies cost cutting and the delivery of projects at a faster rate and, um, and is more commonly practiced in more developed countries to solve issues such as housing gaps, infrastructure inadequacy, and the development of large projects to meet the demand of the population. At this point, you realize that these real, this sort of thing would really be a solution for Jamaica because we're troubled with poor development, we're troubled with fast not too fast turnover and inefficiencies is really second nature to these large um, product, um, projects. Now, in our analysis, we, we looked at areas where PPPs were, considered, were, 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 were done and some of the challenges that they face. So in Asia, 
Um, Goplan and others identified inadequate infrastructure, moderately urbanized areas, lengthy approval processes, and weak financial and land law policy. Africa had a rapid grow, growth in population, unchecked population growth, negligence in the area of, of sustainability, lack of appropriate pricing mechanism, and unproductive government regulations, policies on housing. Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean, where we would fall technically, there was seen that there was a lack of focus on housing and land use in national policy. Now, coming back to Jamaica, we looked at the labor force analysis done by the Statistical Institute of Jamaica, where it illustrated that the working, the working age the workforce of, well, the labor force had increased between 2014 and 2019 by 78,637 individuals, which brings, further, brings home further the point that there is a need and a growing need for affordable housing. Now, for conceptual framework, we looked at the factors affecting housing availability, and we came up with four um, major driving factors, the cost price, the mortgage qualification, the ability to repay, and the deposit attorney, and attorney fees. So we look at these briefly. In the local market, we find that the return on investment expected by the developers are normally larger than normal, and it is basic economics, demand and supply. You have a low supply so you can basically go, um, corner the market in respect of price because you have a large um, demand for mortgage qualification given that the demographic affected are low income earners they are less likely to qualify for the sort of mortgages required to purchase what is being supplied and if they do qualify by whatever means then the question of their ability to replay becomes another factor. Will they default on a mortgage because you have a mortgage of say $150,000 and with moving expenses from exchange rate, cost of living and all that, will you be able to sustain a mortgage? No, that, that you have taken out now five years down the road with all these um, variables. And an immediate concern having been pre-qualified is the fees associated have you saved enough? Um, will you get help, particularly for the younger um, um, applicants coming in? Will their parents be able, or well wishers, be able to assist them with these sort of fees? Now, in our methodology, we use a phenomenological approach, given that we are studying a particular issue that required a particular set of skill set. We focused on just NHT contributors for the population. The sample size were six, um, six interviewee, interviewees that were selective using a purposive sampling. These were people that were industry players, um, developers, and I officials in public institutions dealing with housing developments. Um, the data, the data um, collection, again, interviews. And we sought to analyze interviews using some key parameters that we'll be discussing now. So we, having looked at the, having received the information from, from the interviews, there were certain perceptions that we analyzed the data against. So in this table, we look at the summary, well, the research questions and how we gained the information. And we looked at the interviewees profile. So we had all the participants were leaders in their own right from the private sector and public sector. They were, their qualifications ranged from CSEC um, education all the way up to the master's degree. However, we saw where all the persons had over 
five years of experience in the field and the highest qualification experience in the posts were over 30 years. 60% um, of the persons interviewed delivered projects up to turnkey, that is moving ready, and the others were integral players. So looking at some of the challenges obstructing so successful PP uh, PPP applications, we looked at, again, the perception. So we saw where some of the major driving factors were no government subsidies, for instance, um, poor performance by the devel developer, and the high urbanization in some areas. So as we looked at the interviews, as I have said earlier, these are some of the challenges that were, were outlined. In other areas, we looked at some of the strategies aimed at assisting successful application of PPP, PPP projects. And we found that there was a need to develop, there's a need to develop um, core understandings of PPPs. Again, as we have seen, in Jamaica, it's not a widely practiced concept, and there is very little literature surrounding it, which leads also in some of the things we found. Lack of local competencies, not enough PPP training available, the requirements of, P the, the requirements of PPP partnerships are stringent, and the private sector really does not see the PPPs as viable. Again, they, you develop a property, you can sell it for the, the price you determine. You would not want to affect um, that sort of thing. And one of the major things that we, that was brought home to us whilst doing this is that the cost of housing is really determined by land because the same value for black and steel to build a house in Maxfield the same value of block and steel to build it in Cherry Gardens. The only thing that moves the price would be where it is built and the market that it is catering to. So land cost was also the major, one of the major driving costs of it. Now, the benefits of encouraging the successful application of PPPs would lead to our number one answer being lower housing price per unit greater knowledge, of, knowledge sharing between public and private developers, greater efficiency in the turnaround time for projects to be derived among others. Now, there are several key factors for deriving PPPs. And here we had a perception, we per, we had a perception of six. Um, the inadequate, inadequate capital to provide affordable housing. No one developer can have or find the, you know, enough resources to produce at the, 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 the scale that we need. And no one developer has access to the amount of land that would be needed. And if we should follow recent news, we'll see where the government has a wide and far reaching portfolio in land. And that sort of sharing between both entities, public and private, would lead to um, the benefit of the the develop the the beneficiaries should something like that be pursued, a viable solution for alleviating the crisis of affordable housing in Jamaica. This sort of partnership would bring a direct challenge to the need to squat because ownership of a house provides equity for anybody who wants to build greater wealth. So you do not derive that the same results from squatting because you'd not have the legal rights of tenure, among other things. The ability to share and minimize risks in the case of failure. That is normally the biggest um, concern of any private developer seeking financing from a financial institution. institution. The cost of failure is great and the insurance against failure is great, which is also a driving factor for the prices in the market. Critical success factors for PPPs. Now, based on the information gathered in the interviews, we saw that in order to get these successes, there would be a need for 
frequent conducting of site monitoring and supervision, transparency throughout the process of the project cycle, a sense of ownership, acceptable documents, contract documents, an experienced and competent private partner. So to pursue this sort of venture that is necessary, we recognize that not every private sector partner and um, practitioner who comes forward to say, I want to be a part of the PPP would be considered because not everybody would have the requisite skill or possess the, the, the skill base around them to go on the sort of ventures required. Now, without risk, there is no reward. And in every and we have considered that the risk associated with PPP, PPPs are essentially the same risks that exist now as an individual, whether public or private. That is missed completion date, change of cost due to cost overruns, government interference, inclement weather, uncertainty due to election cycles, which is very popular in our current climate and contract work not being up to standard. So having done the research, we have a few recommendations. Chief among them are that gov the government of Jamaica should seek to assist, should seek the assistance of countries where PPP projects were successful to share expertise and develop competencies in the area. The transferred knowledge ought to be adopted and developed with modifications to fit our construction industry. So whilst PPP is one of the mainstay in Canada or one of those developed areas, their method of, method of application may not be the only method of application or the method of application that is required for Jamaica. So we should not just copy and paste, but seek to modify the Government should consider giving more incentives to encourage public sector players to gain expertise in the area of public-private partnerships as a catalyst to build local competencies in the field. Incentives may not always be money, but we find that as our people gain experience, they tend to branch out where the pastures are greenest. And the special PPP units be established in government ministries where specified talents and experts will be identified and placed in, the, in a single agency of government to supervise the application of public-private partnerships and the passing on of core, sets, score, core skill sets in the area to build a rotating knowledge base so that the information does not retire when a group of people retire. So from here on, it's just a list of references. Thank you for listening. And if there's any questions, we'll take them in time. Thank you very much. Walters, Schloss, and Bailey for your presentation on public private partnerships. I just want to add that this is an area, very, very important area in the public service, but not one where you find much research has been done. So I want to congratulate you and your team for taking this up. And I really do hope that there will be further research done in this area because there is so much, there are so many opportunities out there for these types of partnerships, if we would do the groundwork and the research necessary first before we delve headfirst into it. So thank you once more. Are there any questions for Walters and his team? If not, then we will move right into our final group of presenters from the SEMPA graduate program. And that will be a presentation done on the impacts of online banking attributes on customer satisfaction in Jamaica. And this research assignment was taken on by Owen Bruce, Tracy Ann McKnight, Stacey Ann Johnson, Elaine Brown, and Andre Allen. So at this time, we'll turn over to Bruce and his team to hear more about the impacts of online banking attributes as it relates to customer satisfaction in Jamaica. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. 
My name is Owen Bruce. I'm delighted to be a part of the UCC Research Conference on Innovation 2022. I recently attended the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean and completed the Executive Masters in Business Administration program. Our research dissertation was on the impacts of online banking on customer satisfaction in Jamaica, a case study of NCB and Scotiabank in Kingston and the metropolitan area. My colleagues who presented were Tracy Ann McKnight, Andre Allen, Stacey Ann Johnson, and Elaine Brown. Chapter one of our research included the background, statement of the problem, purpose of the study, research hypotheses, research questions, rationale of the study, significance of the study, limitations and delimitations of the study, organization of the study. Background. Banks have acquired the necessary tools to drive the industry into the 21st century and have been actively diverting technology to conduct their business on a self-service basis known as online banking. Digitization is a transition to online banking. In banking has brought about an exception of various platforms and banking applications rendering less reliance on in-person transactions. The major banks in Jamaica have joined this technological era and are encouraging customers to utilize this type of e-service rather than the traditional method. The way of operating in the banking industry has undergone a fundamental change because of the advent of the internet. Banks are part of the lucrative service sector of Jamaica, which in 2020 contributed 59.74 to Jamaica's GDP, according to O'Neill 2022. Customer satisfaction and retention are becoming critical criteria for online banking success, Bohr, Amherst Smith, Falk, 2005. Statement of the problem. The banking industry has seen a shift, has seen a shift in the traditional brick and mortar locations to online banking. The general problem, however, is as follows. Banking customers have been given few or no options but to conduct their banking services online. The provision of these online banking services may not be ideally suited for all age groups and classes of people. Users feel a sense of neglect and abandonment. Some feel that the service quality being offered by some banks fall below the minimum expectation and others feel dissatisfaction and seek to take their business elsewhere. The purpose of the study. Our research examined the impact that online banking has on NCB and Scotia in Kingston metropolitan area customer satisfaction. This was also conducted to further identify the gaps that currently exists to measure how these gaps affect the willingness of the customers to use online banking facilities. Research hypotheses. One, the null hypothesis there is no statistical significance relationship between transaction preference and online banking satisfaction and challenges. Alternative, there is a statistical significant relationship between transactions, preferences, and online banking satisfaction and challenges. Hypothesis research three, HO, there is no statistical significant difference between banking preferences and respondents, satisfaction with the quality of online banking and the rating of the online banking service quality. HA, this is a statistical significance. There is a statistical significance different difference between banking preferences and respondents. Satisfaction with the quality of online banking and the rating of the online banking service quality. Our research questions. One, to what extent has online banking impacted customer satisfaction? Two, is there a significant relationship between online banking and customer satisfaction? Three, what are the major factors affecting customer satisfaction with online banking in the Kingston metropolitan area? Four, what are the benefits associated with banking with online banking? Five, 
What are the challenges associated with online banking? Rational of the study. To identify and address challenges that impact customer satisfaction, to bring awareness to respective and prospective stakeholders. Again, the significance of the study, the study will benefit the following stakeholders as presented here. Limitations and delimitations of the study. Delimitation. Limited to two selected banks, convenient sampling, specific sampling size, sample size. Limitations. Limited time. Sample size give only a partial representation of the study. Availability of information. Participants were reluctant as they saw some questions as being too personal and the potential for biases. Organization of the study, chapter one. This gave a synopsis of the research study and highlights the significance of the study. Problem statement, purpose of the study, as well as the research question. Chapter two, review of the previous conducted research to identify the potential gaps derived from the literature review. Chapter three, research methodology, areas related to research design, population, sample size, data collection method, pre-testing data analysis, reliability, and validity. And chapter four, data collection summary, explorative, explorative, descriptive, and statistical analysis that highlights the results with the use of tables and figures. Chapter five, finally, interpretation of the research findings, conclusions, remarks, recommendations, and areas requiring future research. Chapter two, the literature review, theoretical framework, online banking, customer satisfaction, relationship of service quality and customer satisfaction, dimension of SurfQual model. Chapter two dealt with the theoretical framework and a model for of this satisfaction process, the expectancy disconfirmation framework. Chapter three of the, of the research methodology, as was previously enunciated. Research design, on time measurement, inexpensive, fast, and quantitative. A cross-sectional survey was used to examine current customer satisfaction with online banking. And it gave these two. Easy to conduct, prone to bias, measure characteristics, do not measure cause and effect. As mentioned, the area of the study, the study was conducted in Jamaica in the Kingston metropolitan area comprising the parishes of Kingston and St. Andrew. KMA is situated on the leeward side of the Blue Mountains and spans between 60 to 70 square miles. Participation in population and sample. Population size of the KMA in 2011 was 662,426 with 154,272 comprising residents under 15 years of age. Our research study targeted eight commercial banks in the KMA. The sample banks, NCB, Scotia, other, with 35% of the population NCB, 22 Scotia Bank. The population here was 176,854, sample 131, and percentage sample was 50. Scotia Bank similarly, sample 131, and percentage of sample 50 and the population represented 22%. And this came from the Bank of Jamaica annual report in 2021. Sample size, the Cochrane sample formula, size formula was used. Sample size technique, judgment sample, sampling, researchers' knowledge and judgment, best suited individuals, least time consuming, population divided into smaller groups. Questionnaires, six page survey, 36, closed ended questions, data collection, methodology, demographic information, preferred financial provider, transactions, online banking usage, benefits and challenges of online banking. Data analysis, the IBM statistical package of, for social sciences, SPSS software was used, descriptive statistical presentations, adequately allow for the various hypotheses of the study to be tested. Validity and reliability, validity, criterion related validity, internal validity, similar results 
for future research, reliability, universal use, issue, interrater, interrate, interrater reliable re approach, honest feedbacks, and pilot testing. Some ethical considerations, approval from UCC Research Ethics Committee, participants' right, rights to privacy, data storage, Google Drive, and referencing source, American Psychological Association, 2020. Chapter four, this section of the report explores and documents respondents regarding their online banking and customer satisfaction. This section of the report, of the report is divided into four main subsections, response rate, demographics, exploratory, data analysis, and statistical analyses. Response rate. Of the 273 respondents targeted for this study, 326 responded, resulting in a response rate of 119.4, as shown in the table below. Demographics. This subsection of the report explores and documents respondents' gender, age, the highest level of education completed, occupation and respondents' average monthly income. Most respondents, 40.3%, reported that they were aged between 28 and 30 year, 38 years of age, while a quarter of respondents, 24.5, indicated that they were aged between 39 and 49 years of age. Slightly more than a fifth of respondents, 21.2%, indicated that they were aged between 17 and 27 years of age, and 10.7% indicated that they were aged between 50 and 60 years old. The smallest proportion of the respondents indicated that they were aged between 61 years, as seen by figure two here. Again, 21.2% between 17 and 27, 40.5%, 28 to 38, and 3.1, 61 years and older. The respondents' age distribution, as presented in figure three, the majority of respondents, 69%, indicated that they were females, while 30.1% indicated that they were males, and only 0.9% indicated that they preferred not to stay, to say, as shown again in figure three. Exploratory data analysis. This subsection of the report explores and documents the impact of online banking on customer satisfaction. Most respondents, 61%, responded that they were customers of the National Commercial Bank, while 39% indicated that they were customers of the Bank of Nova Scotia. Again, as represented below in figure seven. Figure eight showing respondents bank. Six out of every 10 respondents, 61% indicated that they were customers at their banks for over 10 years. This was followed by those who indicated between six and 10 years, 2.5%, while 12% indicated between two and five years and 1.5% indicated that less than a year. Again, as represented in figure eight below. And the question was asked, how long have you been a customer of this bank? Figure 10 asks the question, do you use online banking? Where respondents use online banking. As presented in figure 10, two in five respondents, 40.6%, indicated that they have been using online banking between six and 10 years, while more than a quarter of respondents, 29.6% indicated between two and five years, and 189 indicated over 10 years. The smallest group of the respondents, 11% indicated less than a year. Figure 11, and question. Have online banking impacted your satisfaction? As seen in figure 14, most respondents, 47.2% indicated that they agreed to a large extent that online banking impacted their satisfaction, while 24.2% were indifferent and 20.8% indicated to a very low, large extent. The smallest proportion of respondents indicated a very low extent, 40 I'm sorry, 4.1% and a low extent, 3.8%. Again, as represented here in the table, 
less than 5%, 4.1% to a very low extent. Neutral, 24.2% were neutral, to a large extent, 47.2%. Figure 18 and question, figure 15, is the impact positive or negative? This shows how online banking impacted respondents' satisfaction. Approximately three quarters of respondents, 75.2% indicated that the impact was positive, while a fifth was indifferent, 20.4%, and 4.4 were negative, as shown in the figure, in figure 15 below. and further explained satisfaction with online banking. And it indicated ease of finding information. Again, the number represented here was 318. 16.3% indicated completely satisfied. And if you look to the extreme, 11.2% completely dissatisfied. Transaction accuracy, again, the number here was 316. 25% completely satisfied, 4.1% completely dissatisfied. Transaction benefit time and cost saving, number of persons surveyed here was 315, with 19% completely satisfied, 7.9% completely dissatisfied. Next up we have, what are the challenges associated with online banking that are significantly affecting you? The number here surveyed was 3, 281. Shown in figure 19, showing the benefits associated with online banking. While respondents were asked, what are the challenges associated with online banking that are significantly affecting? More than half of the respondents, 54.1% indicated transactional issues. This was followed closely by those who indicated internet connectivity, 44.8%, and I'm sorry, and 10.7% indicated digital literacy, while 8.9% indicated location was your challenge. And again, as shown in the table below, transactional related issues, 54.1%, digital literacy, 10.7%. And it really comes back to the question, what are the challenges associated with online banking that are significantly impacting you and again most of this most of the respondents 54.1 transaction related issues followed closely by 44.8 percent for internet connectivity two composite scores were created to measure respondents satisfaction with the quality of service online banking satisfaction scale while the other composite score was created to measure respondents evaluation of online banking service quality the service quality scale. The online banking satisfaction scale was created by finding the mean of seven items, ease of finding information, organization of the website, available products on the site, transactional accuracy, user friendliness, transaction benefits, time and cost, and overall satisfaction. The scale ranges from one to five, with one being completely dissatisfied, five being completely satisfied, and so the closer respondents ratings are to five, on the scale, the more satisfied they were with online banking. The service quality scale was created by finding the mean of nine items. I am satisfied with the transaction process by online banking. My satisfaction with online banking services is high and overall online banking services exceeds my expectation. Online banking provides responsive service. Online banking provides up-to-date information. The online banking system has overall costs, lower costs. Online banking is more convenient than traditional banking. Online banking is very useful and easy to use, easy to understand. I prefer using online banking than visiting the branch to do my transactions. This scale ranges from one to five, with one being strongly disagreed, five being strongly agreed. Hence, the closer respondents' ratings are to five on the scale the more they were in agreement with online banking service quality, meaning the more satisfied they were. Chapter five. In this study, we evaluated the impact of online banking on customer satisfaction in the KMA. 
The main elements were customer satisfaction and the online banking environment. Respondents were from two commercial banks in the KMA offering online banking with similar online services. There was no identical, ident I'm sorry, there was no indication to establish whether one bank's platform was easier to navigate than the other. Ends. that was not factored in the study. Respondents from both banks indicated that they were impacted by the introduction of an online banking environment. Chapter five also dealt with customer interaction with online banking, the extent to which online banking impacted customer satisfaction, influence of demographics factors on customer engagement and loyalty, influence of demographic factors on customer engagement and loyalty. Conclusion. This study has examined the impact of online banking on customer satisfaction in Jamaica. To achieve this objective, we deemed it pertinent to provide hindsight and context as it relates to the customer satisfaction derived from interacting with online banking, as well as collecting added information from administered questionnaires. The result of our findings revealed that more than 50% of the participants were employed employees had a bachelor's degree, over 60% were customers of NCB, and 97.5% utilized online banking. To a great extent, participants utilized online banking more than five times per week and did so every over five years. There was an indication of 45% of the population of the participants, sorry, who confirmed that online banking having an impact on customer satisfaction with over 95% confirming that the impact was positive. There were, no, there were also over 104 participants who identified that the resolution time was a major negative impact. Our recommendation, the research established that online banking affects customer satisfaction to a great extent. The research revealed that 97.5% of the respondents indicated that they use online banking. 61% of the respondents were customers of the National Commercial Bank, while 39% indicated that they were customers of the Bank of Nova Scotia. The research also established that customers of both banks regarded the importance of responsiveness and as a significant contribution toward satisfaction. The respondents also highlighted concerns in the case of transaction challenges and the lack of better public communication. Regarding the perceived value and customer satisfaction, this research recommends that banking institutions should enhance their online banking to make their systems uninterruptible and more efficient and responsive, as this has a relatively high effect on customer satisfaction. Suggestion for, few, for further studies. This study observed a basic over, overview in relation to the impact of online banking on customer satisfaction in Jamaica. A case study of NCB and Scotia Bank in Kingston and Kingston metropolitan area. Our study, depending on the participants' perception and experience, which would have been subjected to biases. As such, further studies would be needed to capture a more succinct look at the impacts of online banking on customer satisfaction in Jamaica. Based on this, we suggest that further studies be conducted with a larger population sample and wider demographics. This will be used to determine the contributing variables that will result in stronger statistical evidence from which more informed conclusions and assumptions can be made, as well as make the comparison to this and other previous research conducted, research is conducted. Additionally, we suggest that further research is conducted to capture what is being done by the banks to develop and implement measures to mitigate the consumer challenge, customer challenges and whether or not this has positively impacted the customer satisfaction with online banking. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Bruce and team for sharing with us on the impacts of online banking and customer satisfaction in Jamaica. Another timely presentation as we know and recognize that this is indeed the way that businesses are going to improve their digital processes so that the customer experience might be enhanced. So thank you very much for sharing with us your findings on your research. And I want to thank all the presenters who would have shared with us this morning from the, the um, SEMPA program on the work that they would have done to congratulate them on the solid research that you would have done and to thank you so much and encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. The impact that you're making is much appreciated. Over to you, Mr. Chairman. And, and indeed, those were impactful research presentations that were done by the master's students here at UCC. At this point in time, I'd like to pause. Pause to acknowledge our sponsors, Kiss Baking Company and Star Apple Analytics. Without our sponsors, this research conference would not be possible at all. So thanks to Kiss Baking Company, and thank you very much to Star Apple Analytics. Now, having gone through the research presentation from our graduate students, we will now have a presentation, partnership with Northeastern University uh, about Global Resilience Institute. And this presentation will be brought by Dr. Jacob Dyer Spiegel, who is the Director of Global Partnership and Strategic Initiatives. A round of applause for Dr. Spiegel, please. Our effort in setting up the Global Resilience Research Network is about bringing together expertise that's around the world is all wrestling with the resilience challenge. The goal for us is as we build more research uh, institutes and universities involved with this, is to identify where there is opportunities for collaboration. And then the network's job is to help provide some support for those collaborations to have. Hello everyone, hope you're enjoying the research conference. I'm going to speak briefly today about our newest partner, Northeastern University, and specifically the Global Resilience Institute. Northeastern is based in Boston, Massachusetts, where I am also based. I work on the international partnerships for UCC. So what is this thing they're calling resilience? Um, basically an ability to withstand, recover from, and adapt to periodic shocks and major disruptions and look how we've had COVID-19 as a major example of a disruption. We've had all types of climate um, uh, phenomena happening. Um, and so one of the goals of GRI is to bolster resilience at multiple levels. There's also an individual level um, where we, uh, I think all as educators um, come into a kind of preparatory mode where we are actively training, teaching, and assisting in the development of the next generation of leaders. So in a way, all of us are, are moving forward and, and helping create more resilient societies by being educators. The enhanced mental well-being of a community is of course tied to resilience. All of us are in some way, as educators, as staff, as, as people moving forward the university, we're all somehow making a more resilient society. And so this partnership asks us to kind of actively define that. How? What do you do in a classroom? What is it exactly that is leading to more sustainable business practices? What types of examples are there in, the, in Jamaica and across the Caribbean? These are questions of great interest to GRI. And this partnership uh, is, is one of research at first, but it will soon turn into exchange programs, study abroad, um, different type of grant uh, writing exercises, and co-funded activities that unite 
not only Northeastern and UCC, but that network that I showed. Um, so how do you get involved? We, um, uh, you know, I am based uh, in the United States, and so I don't have access to the campus uh, as much as I'd like to. So I'm working very closely with Mr. Michael Gordon, and of course, Dr. Dawkins to, to see who's interested. And so you may have seen an attachment that I sent out um, maybe a, a couple months ago, and it generated about 32 members of the UCC community who are really interested in becoming international ambassadors. And this is the perfect project because as I had been explaining before, it really gives us a chance to build from the inside to bring our own unique energy into a new partnership and to actively define the way that UCC can contribute and also be the beneficiary of so many different partnerships embedded in the Global Res uh, Resilience Research Network. So thanks for your interest and for your attention and hope to talk to you soon. Dr. Spiegel, um, we realize that the resilience that we seek is not uh, something that is done by one institution or one individual, but it's partnership that will grow this resilience. So we did yesterday, we had a, an, a workshop section of the program where we learned about quantitative research techniques. Today we'll be learning about qualitative, and we have a section called the Qualitative Analytical Plenary. And this will be facilitated by Dr. Ayana Frederick Stevens. Dr. Ayana Frederick Stevens is an alumni of the University of the West Indies, Anglia Ruskin University, and University of Trinidad and Tobago, where she acquired training in both natural and social sciences. She's an avid she avidly enjoys social science research. Her research areas include entrepreneurship and quality of life with special, special dynamics, um, understanding the special dynamics between self-employment versus for paid employment. And she looks at, she has a special emphasis on motherhood and entrepreneurship. She has shared segments of her work at various conferences held in Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, Australia, United States, and Canada. She has authored publications featured in Emerald Publications and Dimitri Press. Dr. Frederick Stevenson is currently assistant professor at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean in the School of Business and Management and teaches courses in entrepreneurship, human resource management, and applied research. So to bring us this section of the program, the workshop on quantitative analytical tools, give a round of applause to Dr. Ayana Frederick Stevens. A very good afternoon and welcome to this qualitative plenary session. I am Dr. Ayanna Frederick Stevens. I am an assistant professor attached to the School of Business and Management at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. Before I hop into my presentation, I want to just take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you, all of those who are attached to the UCC, all of my colleagues, including faculty and staff, students. I also want to take this opportunity to welcome specially invited guests. And so today at this session, I will be speaking on the topic, diving deeper through the data, and I will be speaking about the use of qualitative secondary data analysis in contemporary social science research. This presentation will consist of two parts. In part one, I will be looking at qualitative secondary data analysis 
as an underutilized tool in contemporary social science research. And so I'm saying this off the bat, it is not a new tool, but it is still very much highly underutilized, particularly in social sciences. And secondly, in part two, I will be looking at a systematic approach, a simple one as well, to qualitative secondary data analysis. And in this systematic and simple approach, I will be using an example of some qualitative secondary data analysis that I did for a 2020 publication. Okay, so hopping right into part one, qualitative secondary data analysis and underutilized tool in contemporary social science research. So like I said, secondary analysis is not new, but it's important for me to explain for those of you who are not aware of what it is, what exactly secondary analysis is. So secondary analysis is the reuse of data collected from another source. And so this can be another researcher or data collected, reuse of data collected for another purpose. So I may be the primary researcher on a particular research project and I decide later on to use my data set for a reason other than what it was primarily or originally collected for and this would also constitute secondary analysis. Pretty much secondary analysis is used in order to pursue a research interest which is different or distinct from that of the original work such as to find answers to new research questions. And the reason researchers perform secondary analyses of original data sets, um, firstly, it would be to examine subsets of the original data set. And in part two, when we look at the example um, that I'd be using to teach a simple and systematic approach to uh, qualitative secondary data analysis, you will see that that was the goal to examine a subset of the original data set. And also, um, another goal was to apply a new perspective or a new conceptual focus to the original research issue. There are other reasons, of course, but these are two major reasons why researchers perform secondary analyses of original data sets. So now that I have spoken about uh, secondary data analysis in general, what is qualitative secondary data analysis or QSDA? Now, pretty much in simple terms, it is the reuse of qualitative data for some purpose uh, that wasn't the original intent for which that data was gathered. Um, that would be pretty much qualitative secondary data analysis. And pretty much a trend that is seen um, in research altogether is that there is a well-established tradition of carrying out secondary analyses of quantitative data sets. And this is across social sciences and across other disciplines as well. Um, however, there has not been that tradition of carrying out um, secondary analysis of qualitative data sets. And here are some of the reasons why um, qualitative secondary data analysis has come under some criticism, criticisms and I want to give some early cautions about um, qualitative secondary data analysis as a tool in contemporary um, social science research. Firstly, um, Pretty much qualitative research is all embedded usually in a particular context. And one criticism, therefore, is that it's naive to think that data can be used without 
understanding the cultural details of the production of that um, qualitative data. There's also the issue of research at distance in that qualitative findings are created usually through the interaction of a particular researcher with a particular setting and particular respondents. And so particularly for persons engaging in secondary uh, data analysis, qualitative secondary data analysis to be more specific, um, when they are not the original researcher, they usually don't tend to have that uh, ability to have that interaction with the context and with the respondents of the original study. Um, even where you have primary researchers engaging in secondary data analysis of their own data, um, they usually have a privileged relationship with the data that they have generated. But one criticism is that they do not necessarily have that privileged relationship uh, with the arguments or um, the findings which emerge from that data. But I want to point out at the same time that qualitative secondary data analysis is useful and there are a number of benefits. One of the major benefits of qualitative secondary data analysis is economy. And so researchers utilizing qualitative secondary data analysis usually don't have to invest uh, much time or money or energy compared to researchers who gather the actual um, primary data. Um, even where money is invested, for instance, where data sets need to be purchased, it's usually relatively uh, less costly than for a primary researcher to engage in um, collecting that primary data. It's also easier um, to access in-depth data provided by difficult to access participants or even uh, oversampled groups or populations. And then there's the fact that most studies, um, particularly those in which interviews are used in gathering the data, they generate narratives that go way deeper than um, what's required for answering the research questions of that particular study. And so it is logical to assume that in the analysis of this uh, data, you would have a lot more information being produced, a lot more information being available that, than is required to answer that research question. And so um, qualitative secondary data analysis um, would pretty much reflect a form of efficiency uh, in the utilization of that data. Okay, so now that we've looked at the criticisms and cautions, which, by the way, are some of the huge reasons that persons fail to engage in qualitative secondary data analysis. Not to mention, there are those who may have never heard about it before. But now that you know what qualitative secondary data analysis is, and now that despite the criticisms and cautions of this approach or this tool, you understand its benefits, Let's look at a systematic approach to the use of qualitative secondary data analysis. And pretty much uh, the aim and objective here is uh, when we go through this systematic approach, you would be convinced that this is pretty much very easy, very much worth it, very much doable. And even uh, for us here, at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, those of us faculty who are engaged in research, even students. Um, I, I pretty much lecture applied research and uh, I don't think I've ever seen any students utilize this tool before, um, but hopefully the ease with which it can be um, done would encourage some students going forward to engage in this type of 
um, analysis. So I'll be using um, my own work as an example. And in a 2018 study, this is the original study, and um, it's pretty much, this was a mixed methods study conducted in Trinidad and Tobago, where I am situated. And so it involved the use of both qualitative and quantitative phases of research. But I'm focusing on the qualitative side of things now, all right? Uh, in the original study in 2018, uh, semi-structured interviews were conducted with a small group of business owners across Trinidad and Tobago. And the aim of the study was to determine their perceptions of quality of life and to investigate how various aspects of their quality of life were shaped by their engagement in entrepreneurship. And then there's a secondary study published in 2020, which explored the specific quality of life experiences of mompreneurs and enterprising mothers and their dependent children. Okay. So a preliminary assessment was done. And for this preliminary assessment, again, very simple, in carrying out uh, the secondary analysis and assessment of fit was done. And by assessment of fit, I mean pretty much the primary data set, which consisted um, 20 interview transcripts. That data was looked at. And it was looked at um, through the lens of the secondary research objectives and research questions. So that was done to ensure that within these 20 transcripts, there was information that spoke to or could answer um, the new or current research questions. Um, because the questions for the secondary analysis were found to be sufficiently close to those of the primary research. Um, then I proceeded um, with the other steps. And on the last slide, you saw pretty much these, these study synopsis. Both of them dealt with quality of life, but there was a different conceptual focus that was taken in the second um, study where that focus um, was on mompreneurs solely and not only mompreneurs but specifically those with dependent children so the analytical techniques used on the primary data set were also similar to those to be applied in the secondary analysis we'll go through that in a bit um, but for now just a little preview um, there were semi-structured interviews and uh, uh, pretty much the analytical method of choice was thematic analysis. And so all of those preceding points um, provide a framework for explaining the procedure for the secondary analysis conducted in the 2020 study. And from here on out, it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, step one being sorting the primary data. So the primary data set was uh, reduced through a process of sorting and it was applied for two reasons. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned reasons why researchers engage in uh, uh, secondary analysis. And one is to usually identify a subsample of the broader um, sample, and two, to also limit data sets to data that pertains to the secondary study. Um, data that answers the secondary research questions, all right? And these were the reasons uh, that sorting was conducted in this study as well, to identify the subsample specifically of mompreneurs present within the primary participant population, but also to selectively limit the secondary data set to data which pertain to the issue of um, quality of life 
of enterprising mothers and uh, the quality of life of their children as well, as is influenced by their participation or engagement in entrepreneurship. All right, so I engaged in two rounds of sorting. And uh, in the first round, I narrowed it down out of those 20 um, transcripts, I narrowed it down to just women. All right. And I can't remember off the top of my head that the initial number, but um, the first round was women and then um, mothers, and then mothers of dependent children. And specifically with respect to mothers of dependent children, this took the data set from 20 um, interview transcripts transcripts all the way down to five, all right? And then there was uh, a second round of sorting, all right, where pretty much um, there was a look at the content to ensure that um, the content or the data found within those transcripts specifically addressed the secondary research questions. Now it's important to note here that in the original study there were no direct questions relating to the topic of mompreneurship and how um, children of de uh, dependent children of mompreneurs were impacted by their mother's engagement in entrepreneur entrepreneurship. But naturally these interviews lasted an estimated 45 minutes and so there was a lot of discourse there was a lot of con conversation going back and forth between me as researcher and the respondents and so naturally they would they would speak about their children during the interview and this provided a wealth of information that could have been used in the um secondary data analysis of this qualitative data all right so again there was a reduction from 20 transcripts to five transcripts. And then each transcript was further assessed for the quality of the data. I told you before, and I promise that the rest is history. The rest is pretty simple um, because the remaining steps followed the six steps of data collection outlined by as well and this is something that we usually engage in particularly those who are uh, pretty much versed in qualitative research many times when we engage in qualitative research the analytical tool of choice is thematic analysis and uh, Creswell he outlined the six steps that we engage in anyway um, it's just that we, when we engage in secondary analysis of qualitative data, we forego the first um, stage, which is to collect, to actually collect um, the data, all right, and to transcribe it. So again, economics, a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort and energy is, uh, is saved just by engaging in this um, approach to data analysis. So the remaining steps followed the six steps of data collection outlined by Creswell in 2013. Firstly, reading through the data and reflecting on its overall meaning. So after the data is sorted and you have a certain number of uh, transcripts, for instance, to go through, you read through the data because remember you may be familiar with this data already but bearing in mind that a new conceptual focus is being applied to this research and so it's in, it's important to go through this data again to read through and to reflect on its overall meaning um, through the lens of the new study that you are conducted then exploring the data through coding again coding may be totally different because a new conceptual fo uh, focus has been applied to this research uh, using the code to develop themes representing and reporting the findings again this may be done in a completely and should be done in a completely different way 
um, from the original study because again the um, objective is different interpreting the meaning of the findings and validating the accuracy of those findings i want to point out however that uh in this instance particularly if you are the secondary researcher you didn't co collect the, re the uh the data initially all right um, or even if you collected the data initially and a long period of time has elapsed um, between when you gathered the data and when you uh, plan to reuse the data, there may be some issues with validating the accuracy of those findings. Um, it may be less possible to engage in strategies such as member check-in, for instance. Um, because you may have lost touch with those who you collected the data from initially, or if you did not collect the data, uh, particularly because of um, the ethical considerations that usually guide research, um, these participants may be anonymous and you may not be able to find them to um, validate the accuracy of the findings, all right? So a little issue with that there, but it's still worth it. All right, let's take a little overview and assessment of um, the secondary study. So the purpose of the secondary study, again, was to determine how entrepreneurial engagement affected quality of life for mompreneurs and independent children. And it took into consideration several aspects of quality of life, both the tangible ones like uh, standard of living as well as the less tangible ones um, like family life, uh, uh, social life, uh, health and wellness, and there were a few others, there were about seven of, of those dimensions that were assessed. And emerging from the interviews were discussions surrounding entrepreneurial triggers, why these women decided to engage in entrepreneurship. Um, the perceived impacts of um, their entrepreneurial engagement on their quality of life, whether those were um, felt to be favorable or unfavorable. And the interviews in particular gathered anecdotal evidence from these women. Some of this will be presented in a bit um, regarding their standard of living, their family um, life, their ability to recreate and other um, areas as mentioned earlier. So very quickly, um, a breakdown of, of these five women. So Amber, and of course these are pseudonyms, Amber was in her 30s at the time of the interview, married with one child, and this was a son under the age of 10. And she was engaged in entrepreneurship for pretty much um, that same amount of time, 10 years. She operated an event management firm from the comfort of a home while also providing repertoire and transcription services. Then there was Sapphire, a little older, 40 to 50 years old, and running a transportation company with her husband and her in-laws. She was involved in the business for approximately 21 years and had two teenage children, an older boy and a younger girl. Pearl was, at the time of the interviews, between 29 to 39 years old, and uh, her business was pretty much the overseeing um, of the sale, maintenance, and repair of marine engines, and this she did together with her husband. She occasionally conducted her activities from home, but pretty much for the majority of the time, she conducted it at an office away from home. Her venture was, at the time of the interviews, two years old, um, and she was the mother of two children, a teenage boy and a preteen girl, whom she hoped at least one of them would assume the leadership of the business um, someday. Then fourthly, we have Jade, uh, pretty much into design and outfitting of professional women by providing a range of industrial uniforms. So we're looking at uh, chef aprons, lab coats, scrubs, you name it. So at the time of the interviews, Jade's business was 10 years old. And with respect to her family dynamics, she was unmarried and had two children, 
one was a young adult and the other teenager all right it didn't come out in the interviews uh pretty much if it was a boy or a girl or right um but pretty much she was also between 40 and 50 years old at the time of the interviews and lastly there was crystal 29 to 39 years old not married but soon to be at the time of the interview at least and she was at that time a mother of one operating a group of companies from her home but in a particular office space that was um built and dedicated to her running those businesses there her only child was a daughter just under 10 years old at the time of the interviews and she had been an entrepreneur for nine years all right and for the sake of time i pull up um some information some interview extracts so that you can see the wealth of information that came out of these interviews and though again the initial study did not deal with this issue of mompreneurship and quality of life specifically how um enterprising mothers had their quality of life impacted by the engagement in entrepreneurship and how it affected their children the initial study uh pretty much produced sufficient information to speak to this issue so this is actually i'm just going to touch on a, a few because remember i said there were about seven dimensions that were assessed and we're talking about five women here so for the sake of time i won't be able to go through all but i just pulled a few um so that you can see the depth of information that came out so amber here is talking about um her material well being you know, on her standard of living and she asked the question so many times to herself should i go back to work she says it gets difficult because you get a job in january then one in february march april may june july you get nothing then you might get something in august she says my husband has a stable job but if that were not the case then we would be having some problems because you can't tell me you got a job in january and the next one is in august what's going on with your children between then bad quality of life to me is not providing or not being able to provide for your children they come and ask you for something to eat and you look in your cupboard and you have nothing all these things lead to unhappiness you're going to be stressed when your child comes and asks you for something to eat and you're going to cry because you know you can't give them anything that's amber talking about um, the lack of jobs the lack of contracts and how this um has affected her ability to uh pretty much take care of her child and thank god for her husband he had a stable job then this is amber again on the positive side of things when she speaks about her family life she says if i were not an entrepreneur i would not be able to spend much time with my son because i would have to get up early go to some godforsaken eight to four job entrepreneurship has given me more time with my family that is why i remain a business owner let's look at jade jade um in this response talks about uh kind of like a cross between work life and family life and she says when i started at first i was working at home and they would see me a lot now because she works at an office away from home she says she comes to work at 8 a.m and if nobody calls to say it's time to come home i'll stay until midnight my only free day is sunday and that's to do housework so it affects the time she spends with her family um another person who spoke about the negative impacts of um entrepreneurship on their family life uh was sapphire and she says when you have to go to work you cannot sit down to actually have dinner together with them or by them um at that time she was referring to her children and then of course there's also jade who speaks about family life as well if they my children are really sick i don't have to ask 
or boss permission to go and see about my kids. I can just close up my shop and go and see about them. So this was a positive impact. So there were mixed um, perceptions about the impact of entrepreneurship on quality of life for, for these women and also for their children. All right, there were some mixed perceptions and pretty much these mixed perceptions were in almost all of the categories. And so naturally, just like any other study, um, there would be things that would go through your mind. Does this have to do with the type of business they own? Does it have to do with the ages of their children? Does it have to do with the fact that they may be single mothers, uh, married, etc.? All right. Basically, many of the questions that would arise from um, this study had it been conducted as a primary study. All right. And there was a primary analysis of the interview data. The same questions arise. All right. But uh, just a few closing remarks. What's the point? Like I said before. Qualitative secondary data analysis is by no means new. Um, perhaps, however, its use has not been expanded due to a lack of knowledge by researchers as to how to engage in this type of analysis. But again, it is so, so simple um, that it's almost shocking that more uh, researchers aren't engaging in this type of research. Um, although there are many similarities with primary data analysis, as you saw before, including steps in data processing and analysis, there are unique challenges presented in particular in matching data to purpose. And like we saw when I looked at the six steps of um, thematic analysis presented by Creswell 2013, there are also usually issues. Um, surrounding validation of the findings uh, and this pretty much limits the credibility and the usefulness of the data but again I close um, by saying as I show you my references that pretty much um, no research is without its limitations and so I offer to you um, this tool as uh, something that we can use going forward to really dig deeper, right, and to find out more as to what um, these populations of interest that we often research are trying to speak to us. This concludes my presentation, and I thank you for your attention, and I also um welcome any questions you may have at this time thank you so so very much dr ayana frederick stevens the the quality qualitative research tool is a very is an essential tool for researchers at this level of study Dr. Ayana Frederick Stevens is assistant professor in the Department of Business Administration. Thank you so much for that presentation. And now we will be getting more information from a guest speaker. A guest speaker today is Mr. Wayne Beecher. Mr. Beecher has over two decades of senior management experience in both the public and private sector, where he has developed expertise in strat strategy, innovation, project management, and technology application. He's the founder of Alt Catalyst, a professional service firm with a mission to identify, inspire, and catalyze the next generation of human-centered design innovators. His most recent assignment was a management portfolio with the, with, for development, innovation, and, and multilateral investment fund uh, with the IDB, that's the Inter-American Development Bank. Since leaving the IDB, Mr. Beecher has applied his energy and skills to seeding, accelerate, 
exceeding and accelerating several innovative and entrepreneurial ventures. He has also undertaken several impact-oriented assignments with global and regional development partners to unlock the entrepreneurial and innovation eco ecosystem in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. He's a certified project, project management professional with a degree in management studies and accounting and an MBA. Please make welcome Mr. Wayne Beecher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here this afternoon. Um, my presentation will focus on economic empowerment through entrepreneurship. Um, and it's, 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 it's really consistent with the theme and so all the presentations we made so far um, with a focus on innovation te and technology. But I kind of switch it to culture. So why am I doing this and why am I um, so honored to be here? Uh, my personal mission is the democratization of economic empowerment through entrepreneurship. Um, and as a consequence of this, um, the vision is that within the next five to seven years, we will have a billion dollar startup coming out of Jamaica. Um, and that's what we call a uniform, unicorn in the startup world. So the, the brief presentation I'll be um, this afternoon will be centered around a theory of change by economic empowerment. And why is this important? I've been spent a number of years in the development space. Um, I, you realize that a lot of the development projects that we pursue you know, lack the kind of long-term or sustainable impact that we need. Um, and I, mean, I was inspired by the work of a Harvard professor, Clay Christensen, and the one of his research systems, um, where they, they, create, they wrote a book called The Prosperity um, Paradox, where you look at some of the conditions that impacted um, developing countries and why they the, the prescription for development intervention doesn't yield the kind of results that we would like it to yield. Um, and they came up with a concept called the market created innovation. What I've done is stack some of that, 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 that thesis um, with another thesis I'm calling the, cog the, the cognitive catalyst. I've been observed um, a lot of correlation um, between what has been done in, in the more developed countries um, and more emerging countries than Jamaica. And the application of templates here, um, based on that correlation, you identify that the result is just not, you know, not what it was supposed to be. Um, and so I think there was a missing element from the development toolbox. Um, and I think that has to do with the, the mental shift required to trigger some of the changes. Um, to, to create the kind of ownership for action that's required and uh, the kind of leadership that we can, can actually shift us from where we are now to where we want to go. So I'm just going to dive into elements of the theory of change. The first aspect is about innovation and here I want to focus on innovation that matters. They, 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 I will explore for that, we'll explore the concept of market created innovation. Now, not all innovations are created equally. I mean, there are sustaining innovations that a lot of more the, the, um, mature companies use. Um, they, and this is a safe kind of innovation for them. They're creating a new version, a new model of the iPhone or the Samsung Note, it's a model. The Samsung 22, iPhone 13, 14, and 15 will come. Those innovations are good. It improves the performance of the product. It serves the existing consumer base. That means it is safe. You know, and uh, going after um, a little bit more of their disposable income. Um, it creates few jobs because you might require that you might need to re-engineer the manufacturing line. But on the overall economy, there's not much impact. The neutral, it's a neutral kind of a trade-off. Efficiency innovations are what drive larger mature companies that seek to you know, evolve beyond their infection point in a very tipping sort of way. Um, they try to do less with more, targeted existing customer base. Um, and you know, this 
can relate to you know, the, the use of technology, um, which sometimes eliminate jobs. And if you eliminate jobs, then you really have a negative impact on the economy. Um, then the kind of innovation that we really want to focus on now is all called market created innovation. These are the kind of innovation that you know target the new customer base. So there's some inherent risk there, right? Um, but the long-term effect is that it can create jobs, it can create new sources of, of wealth, and it can enable development. Um, example of this is be, you know, drawing on one of the early research about creating um, access to affordable homes or insurance for affordable homes or referring to online banking survey, creating um, a financial services platform that can shift Jamaica's um, financial inclusion from where is it now to, to almost full, um, full engagement. So when we talk about market created innovation, I'm just going to give an highlight as to some of the main features of a market created innovation. The, first of all, market created innovation target non consumption. We identify that there's a large, almost 60% of the population that is not, not fully banked or underbanked. Um, and then there's the, the, the 10 million, the 10,000 gap per year that was pointed out earlier in in terms of accessing to affordable, that's a large and growing um, unattended marketplace that needs to be they need to be served if we're going to be doing well as a overall economy. Um, and some persons might not be able to afford those services, or accessing those services might be too complicated, and so it remains unattainable to uh, for them. And the idea here is to not just focus on the, the commodity of the product or services that you're offering. But to focus on higher order needs. So the need affordable home is the product, but what is required is a safe built environment or a comfortable home in which to, to, to relax and to socialize and to, to grow a family. You know, so higher order needs speak to the emotional component of the of the, the, the value proposition that you should be targeting. And in truth, because they're serving a large unattended market locally, the same issues that might impact us in this country might be relevant to other countries. And so, you know, while you're thinking within the local context, you should always be gearing your business model to go global. And that's what will create the kind of scale of growth um, that's necessary. Now, when you create a market, when you pursue an innovation like this that's completely disruptive, sometimes we just don't have the infrastructure in place to support it. When Ford made the modern modern T and, and said that it's going to give access to um, all Americans or motor vehicles, roads didn't exist in any in any in any, any great way or shape. Um, gas stations were a few. So that in, that invest in all of those infrastructure or inspire that value chain to be built out around the product or service they're, in, they're introducing. Um, and then that requires an innovation culture because innovation culture is what causes the contagion of the product or services that you're, you're offering to be cascaded throughout the ecosystem and draw the kind of multiply effect that you, you want. And of course, you have to leverage technology. In, in a small open economy like Jamaica, technology is key because technology is what gives you the ability to replicate your products or service in a very efficient way that results in the economics of scale of art to give your business model the unit economics to be, to be profitable and sustainable. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, if you're doing a sustaining innovation, that's, that's actually low risk. It's a sign of the existing process and it's serving an existing market, still so get a, a, a quick payback in the medium term. Likewise, efficient innovation. But market created innovations are actually requires a lot of capital up front um, with a, a mindset that you're gonna have to wait for a long time to achieve a long-term payback. Because what you do, you're creating a market, and you're creating a value chain around the market that you're trying to, to, to develop. And so to, to pursue this, and this is part of why I've not done it in a meaningful way in Jamaica. We need a change in our mindset. As 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 researchers and future entrepreneurs and business leaders, we sometimes shy away from taking bold, innovative entrepreneurial risks. 
the current European condition to play it safe. But we can't do that anymore. It was the part of mental weakness so, to help us identify who we are and that we're sons and daughters of the creator that gives us the ability to create anything we want. Um, and a lot of the, the, the development toolkits that have been deployed in terms of trying to create an inter intervention for growth, you know, kind of miss this element. Another missing element is leadership. Um, leadership on different dimensions, leadership of oneself, leadership of others, and leadership of leaders. Um, I mean, leadership is really a point of knowing yourself and identifying your purpose and proceeding with passion. Once you do that, you create a cause yourself, and other persons will be attracted to your cause. Because people like to be around people who believe what they believe. And so the idea is to support other persons in identifying who they are and, and creating their own cause or supporting your cause. And at, at, and at, at the highest level, you're creating leaders that create leaders that create leaders. And the multiplier effect is, is will become contagious. The innovation culture is actually important. And this will go against everything that we've been socialized and conditioned to to accept as real because our condition and our conditioning and socialization, you know, kind of create a punitive, a punitive set of response to anything and the risk that we take or we fail. But innovation is an iterative process, it's not very efficient. You will try, you will fail, and you will learn from both quantitative and qualitative uh, research, and you will find an answer. Now that it might take month, two months, three months, five months, but you just don't know when you'll hit the point where you get to um, a breakthrough. So it requires the resilience to accept that not getting the results you want in the first try is not actually a bad thing, it's actually the path to success. And so leaders have a role to play in this space, that they have to create a, a safe space for persons to fail fast, learn and progress. And if we don't do that, you know, we're not going to grow. And I think this is the kind of culture shift that's required to, to take us to the, another level. Because outside of these factors, we have all the native skill sets and confidence required to become world leaders. Because we have done it in other fields, but we have not done it in a meaningful way um, collectively to get our country to the next level. Um, and I'm going to summarize that offering a formula which you, you, you esteem researchers can 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 work with cabot here i am not a re academic or research professional but i'm going to offer a formula for economic empowerment at a national or a corporate level that you could embrace so um the formula is e equal ic to the third um the e means economic empowerment for entrepreneurship that I is for innovation that drive economic growth. And the C, which is a catalyst, um, speak about the confidence to take action, creating a market, creating an innovation culture, and which is anchored by a shared code of ethics. Um, I think this is, a, this is a good enough framework that the students could look at, evolve, and improve. Um, and then we could perhaps advise our leaders to, to pursue this kind of framework or theory of change or formula when they pursue long-term economic growth projects and intervention. And I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Wayne Beecher. And uh, many moons ago, we learned that E is equal to MC squared, but we now have a new formula. Um, e is equal to IC to the third power, and that is for change and growth. You come to the UCC uh, conference and you learn something new. Right before we get to the, the final, the, the grand finale, we now will have the repertoire, and that is where we have a summary of both days' events. And that's brought to us today by Associate Professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences here at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean, that is Professor Mohan.
Professor Krishna Mohan has over 25 years of academic experience in India and internationally. And he is an author and has been published in many, many journals. At this point in time, I ask you to give a round of applause to Dr. Mohan, Professor Mohan, who will bring the rapporteur. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Thank you. You may go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear us? Good afternoon to all. It's a great honor to present a brief report of a very exciting uh, conference on innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology. The sixth UCC annual conference focused on a very important research theme, harnessing resilience through technology and innovation is an important power we have and UCC has shown that it can show to the world through research done by students, undergraduate, graduate and doctoral students faculty, and it can also collaborate and bring experts. And this conference can pave a way to solve global problems, provide solutions, and help the people, governments, and the world at large that research can provide the lasting solutions. When I looked at the two-day conference and various presentations, I felt it's a unique conference. The simple reason is not only just research presentations, but it has components which enhance knowledge and skills in research and how one can, through research, innovate and provide solutions to the world. I looked at three important features of this very unique conference. The first and foremost, the topics of research presentations covered across business, finance, human resource management, entrepreneurship, latest science and technology, artificial intelligence, mental health, healthcare management, focusing on providing solutions, insights, and policy directions for a better world. As in the opening remarks, our president has made it very clear how important is research not only for the world, but for the UCC. And the UCC has considered research as one of the pillars of its excellence. Given this background, and again, it was reiterated in the second day by the chairman of UCC board that 
the two-day research conference is a significant milestone to make sure that the students and the faculty are engaged in research and apply their knowledge, contribute to the welfare of the world. The moderators for the both days has done an excellent job to make sure all the presentations went well. And I would like to share briefly that the unique features include five very interesting, thought-provoking and insight-driven research done by the doctoral students at UCC and University of Sutherland. All the five presentations shown us that research can be the key for empowerment, growth, development, solving many problems. In that context, the five presentations are the future to show way and lead us for the growth and development in their respective fields. The undergraduate poster presentations again shown that even though they have their own limitations in terms of the sample size methodology, but the topics they have taken in areas like business, finance, banking, human resource management, mental health, and online teaching, again reiterated the importance of these areas in research. And I'm very glad to know that two of the behavioral science department uh, research uh, being awarded second and third places. Uh, and I feel uh, overwhelmed that undergraduate students have contributed uh, to the growth of uh, research. And more importantly, the research focused on Jamaican issues and the region at large. The second day, the graduate students' presentations were very interesting in the areas of banking, issues related to work from home, crime, housing. Again, very uh, important topics and applied in nature, providing way forward, how best we can uh, solve certain problems and provide solutions. The faculty research presentations, all the four presentations uh, focused on very sp specialized specific areas from application of basic mathematics and equations, from a science and technology, interdisciplinary research and its applications to visual media and so and so forth. And the methodology, methodological issues in research play a very important role. And mixed methods uh, research presentation showed us how important is uh, the methodology and methodology provides uh, quality research. The other two research, one on uh, a very interesting upcoming research on crowd funding for startups, especially from the Jamaican context, as well as the job satisfaction and commitment among the public sector teachers uh, in the Caribbean region uh, contributes to productivity and um, growth among the education sector. So all the four presentations provide us an insight into what a good quality research is all about. To put together all the research presentations or around 20, uh, it's a very good number and the two days left us with uh, food for thought 
and uh, directions for future research. We also had uh, two plenary workshops, very important. This is an important dimension for the UCC annual conference, research conference where not only just uh, research is presented, but uh, the workshops provide uh, basic advanced knowledge and skills uh, for young researchers uh, and students. In that context, the two plenary workshops, one on quantitative, the other one qualitative, provide us uh, a very uh, uh, depth understanding uh, and recent developments and how to go about. We also had uh, a brief uh, invited talk or a keynote on economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, and uh, how critical it is for the development of nation and uh, the region at large. In that context, the keynote provide us a direction and a formula, in fact, how we can really empower people economically. Of course, there is uh, some kind of a collaboration initiative by the Global Resilience Institute, and it's appropriate for the conference to have that kind of a linkage and uh, a kind of an insight, as well as a direction for how to uh, handle crisis and uh, how to uh, develop that resilience to overcome, especially given the challenges we had, uh, the, the, the pandemic and uh, the impact of COVID-19 across the globe. To put it in a perspective that most of the research papers focused on applications, provided insights for policy, created opportunities for future research covered areas from across disciplines and more importantly, gave an opportunity for birding researchers, students to share their research and get the feedback. In that context, the moderators played a very critical role and the questions answer sessions uh, very uh, encouraging and uh, exciting as well as thought provoking uh, gave us an opportunity to ponder on what to be done in the future. Most of the papers, research papers focused on contemporary issue, need-based research topics. This is another highlight of the UCC annual research conference. Uh, I can say all the research papers presented by undergraduate, graduate, and the doctoral research students are of high quality and contributed to the database, research database of Jamaica and the Caribbean region at large. In that way, U UCC has contributed to the bigger uh, database, scientific database, and I'm sure uh, the proceedings of the conference uh, will provide uh, an opportunity to the world to understand uh, what's happening in Jamaica as well as uh, the region. And more importantly, open up for collab research collaborations and network and linkages uh, to make sure that university becomes a stakeholder for nation and the region development and UCC uh, through its re annual research conferences uh, can play a significant role, which the president of the university has emphasized that the university is committed for high quality research and his encouraging words for students and the faculty that all support is given 
for cutting edge research. And with those inspiring words, uh, I thank the UCC uh, management as well as the conference organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to briefly present the two day UCC annual research conference report. Thank you. Another round of applause for Professor Mohan, please. Really well put together summary of both days. It's been a pleasure serving as your Masters of Ceremony for today, day two of the research conference. At the start of the conference, we identified that our human motivations, our primary human motivations were curiosity and hope. And the fact that this research conference was a part of that drive. And we have uncovered insight, as Dr. Professor Mohan said, insights, solutions, and we will influence policy direction. Just a few final words from me. The theme of the conference was harnessing the power of technology through innovation for global resilience. Now, when I looked at the word harnessed, there were some synonyms to, 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 um, to saddle, to strap, to couple. But one of the things I liked, particularly like as it relates to today's conference, was the definition of harness that meant to capture and to make use of. We have captured information today. We have captured information in the time that the students spent to do their research. And now we intend to make very good use of it as we take UCC, the University of Innovation to the next level. Now to bring closing remarks is Dr. Lilith Toms Tomlinson. Dr. Tomlinson is the acting vice principal of UCC Academy. She has served as the principal of the ECAP as well as vice principal for the K-13 program for approximately three years. She is a graduate of the University of the West Indies and the Caribbean Graduate School of Theology where, and she obtained a PhD from Andersonville University. Dr. Tomlinson, affectionately known as Dr. T, is the host of a TV program called Sip and Chat, which is aired on MTN. And she provides voluntary service for a number of NGOs catering to youth development in the inner city community. Please, a round of applause for Dr. Tomlinson as she brings closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. McKenzie. Chairman of the UCC Board of Directors, Dr. Ronald Rooms, UCC Board of Directors and Foundation members, Group Executive Chairman, UCC Group of Companies, Dr. Winston Adams, Deputy Group Executive Chair, UCC Group of Companies, Mrs. Geraldine Adams, University President, Mr. Aldine Davies, University Chancellor, Professor Dennis J. Gale, the Most Honorable Professor, Sir Kenneth Hall, Executive Vice President, Institutional Effectiveness and Research, Professor Bernadette Warner, Associate Vice President of Academic Student Affairs, Dr. Ivan Dawkins, UCC Chaplain, Pastor Samuel Lewis, Supervisors from the University of Sunderland of the United Kingdom, UCC Doctoral Honorees Today, 2022, and they are as follows, Dr. Leighton McKnight, Dr. Godfrey Dyer, Dr. Sandra Reed, other special invited guests, judging panel for undergraduate research papers, learned researchers, presenters, and all other participants, UCC faculty, staff, and students. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. By its very nature, research conferences are the best place for researchers to connect with peers and specialists in their field, to share with others and stay abreast of modern trends. Innovation, methodologies, and tools of this trade in such forum. Researchers often overcome roadblocks in research projects, receive valuable contribution, acquire information and expertise on the latest and most recent advancement in their field. 
The UCC 2022 Research Conference on Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Technology did all of that and more. Yesterday set the stage for excellence with the DBA presentations, undergraduate degree poster presentation, information technology capstone project presentation, the quantitative analytical plenary and the innovation center research presentation. We had our first address by the UCC's new president, Dr. Aldin Davis, whom we welcome warmly to the UCC research family. Today, we had the pleasure of engagement with our UCC board chairman, Dr. Ronald Rooms, who ushered us into yet another outstanding and stimulating presentation. Our UCC faculty confirmed their mastery of analytical research in four excellent presentation. The UCC College of Graduate Studies and Research presentation illustrated a depth of teaching and preparation, as did the qualitative analytical plenary facilitated by Dr. Ayano Frederick Stevens. We had the pleasure of a spirited and informed address by our guest speaker, Mr. Wayne Beecher, CEO of Altcalis, with much food for thought as we continue to reflect that we would have special benefits for our students contemplating jobs as professional researchers. Our chairpersons, moderators, and question and answers facilitators, Mr. Gary McKenzie and Dr. Janelle Allen, and Mr. Ricardio Madden, respectively, as well as our rapporteur present, Professor Puthran Mohan, expertly guided the proceedings contributing to a highly professional and interesting day. We acknowledge the kind support of our sponsors, including the Kiss Baking Company, Jamaica, and Dr. Mario Wood, without whom this conference would not have been possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we owe a depth of gratitude to the Research Conference Planning Committee, chaired by Dr. Jalroy Chaffers, who worked tirelessly to ensure a conference benefiting the status of the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean as a formidable competitor in the National Caribbean Academic Arena, mission accomplished. I am certain that we will emerge from this conference more educated and informed and perhaps inspired to explore new fields of research in keeping with the UCC's mission, fostering leadership and innovation. What is clear is that we cannot remain relevant and competitive by ignoring important new trends. The work must continue. Thanks to all who have contributed to this cross-pollination of ideas, our introduction to new and emerging trends and the impact and implication of these research projects on Jamaica land we love. We are all the better for the interaction over the past few days. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you so very much.